CB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It is half past seven. It's on to AM, and you're very welcome along to this Friday's edition of the show. We've got an absolutely stacked show for you. Needless to say, we are going to spend a lot of the morning uh, talking about the All Ireland football final. It is the eve, and we'll also touch on the camogie as well. That little rattle you can hear in the background is our man. It's like when Michael Palin, Palin even, got dispatched to Mogget issue. It's Owen Shane, and he's in <laughs> Oma. Owen, oh, come on in. What's happening? How's it going? Welcome. So, Oma, uh, we are in a town that is absolutely buzzing for tomorrow. You're right, it's the eve of, all, of the All-Ireland Final. It does feel strange that it's on a, a Saturday and that Friday is very much the eve of it. Uh, once that band gets out of the way, you'll be able to see the poster over my shoulder, which is a beautiful, superimposed photograph of... Well, sorry, it's not superimposed. It's Conor McKenna sitting on the Iron Throne at Game of Thrones. Sam is coming, starring Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar. We are outside Sally's here in the middle of Oma, a place that is legendary for its pre-final posters. 2008, you might have remembered, the Gooch Busters poster that they had up there with uh, Gooch's face superimposed onto uh, the ghost from Ghostbusters with Brian Dewar, one of the protagonists on that occasion. He is the protagonist once again for tomorrow. And I can only say that this county in general, not just Oma, is absolutely buzzing for tomorrow night. It sounds like, Owen, you've started off, you're more of a Tyrone man than a Tyrone man. No, I'm a, I'm a Tyrone man. Oh, why you? did I say, to, why, what did, what did, well, I, I, mean, did I, I let I, myself down? Are people, are people, when you've been going around saying, oh, it's great to be here in Tyrone, have people been sort of picking you up on it? No, I'm, I've, I've been corrected on Tyrone years ago. Years ago <laughs> someone, someone in college told they're, me that it's Tyrone, not Tyrone, yeah, and I got te- a rude they're, awakening. They're touchy about it as well. What, well, it's the name of their county. What's the uh, what's the general buzz been like? You've been obviously this is the fourth of the county you've been at involved in the various finals. What, how does it compare to the other counties you've been at over the last few weeks? Well, it's, it's right up there, to be honest. I, like I, I, it's very hard to to try and compare and contrast all of these different counties because they've got such different cultures. Tyrone is an interesting one for obvious reasons, and it's different to the other three counties I've been at, where you drive obviously coming from County Mayo, you drive through Fermanagh and get into Tyrone and the first couple of towns you get through, not necessarily a sense that there is actually anything happening this weekend. But then you start to drive through uh, some different towns and you get closer to, say, Ochnacloy, which is my first stop yesterday. And you start to realise, hold on a minute, people go absolutely mental. The GEA community uh, and the community that's interested in Gaelic games go absolutely mental for this. It's going to be interesting. We'll be chatting to Declan Bogan and the McGinley a little bit later on. And they say that all uh, communities have really row in uh, on All-Ireland Final Week, that you have people who don't traditionally watch Gaelic games coming out of the woodwork on All-Ireland Final Week, which I guess is a good thing. So I've gone from Ochnacloy. We went out all the way to Ardbo on, on the shores of Loch Ney yesterday as well, which would be Brian McGuigan territory. And all the way out there, they're absolutely buzzing for what's going to happen this weekend. We came back in uh, towards Garavahi as well, managed to get a, a sneak peek before training started last night of Garavahi. And then we finished up here in Oma, where there was a roadshow last night. A number of roadshows going on around the county in the build-up to tomorrow, people uh, have this insatiable appetite for preview because it really feels that this is the first All-Ireland that Tyrone has a proper chance of winning since 2008. Yes, they've been there since. They, they were there only three years ago, but this feels so different to 2018. But, uh, as you know, I haven't been in Mayo and I was down there myself recently, the county has gone absolutely buck crazy for this. There are inhabitable, uh, uninhabitable parts of Valley uh, McCrory that are that you can't, that are painted red and green. The sheep are red and green. Everybody's singing the red and green in Mayo. There are uh, rosary beads uh, up and zeet seats up and down the county on that are uh, would it rub to it in an inch of their life with praying for, for them to get over the line tomorrow um, and, and like there's a lot of the country obviously that's behind them and I think that that's uh, I mean I don't know that it's so much anti Tyrone right but I also think that if I'm from Tyrone or involved with the squad then I'm like that's anti Tyrone and I've got a bit of a chip on my shoulder about it is that the sense that you're getting there that it's like everybody hates us and we don't care I would say that that would definitely be the case within the camp but I think that actually has seeped out towards the people of Tyrone as well, where they have that sense of swagger where they just laugh off any sort of negative criticism of this team for whatever reason this summer or or any sort of distaste that traditionalists would have towards them going all the way back to, to Pasquilan and his few football in 2003. The supporters at this point absolutely live off that stuff. They love it because they know that the players love it. And you're right, that is exactly going to be the thing that this camp are, are going to be using as, as motivation. But one of the, the, the interesting themes that I've certainly got over the last couple of days is, yes, that's a really important factor, but I think we're completely 
underrating what someone like Brian Duher has done on a footballing level with this Tyrone team. I think we see him as the inspirational captain back in the day and the inspirational manager now and, so, and the man who's tapping into that really. But I'm not sure. The more people I'm talking to around the county, the more I'm like, is Brian Duher actually underrated in terms of his managerial prowess, his, his tactical ability? And even if you take away all that emotional stuff and that siege mentality, Brian Duher is a bloody good manager. And, and that's one of the themes that I'm taking out of this, that, yeah, it is important, but it's not everything. Yeah. Uh, like the two of them have a bit of a weird CV, haven't they? We might get into that a little bit later on, like in terms of, I mean, who has at Intercounty GEA until you actually get at it, got that sort of top level CV. One last question before, because I know you've got some loads of stuff, been gathering loads of stuff over the last 24 hours, and so many compliments about your own uh, from people in the different counties you've been at over the last couple of years, people that I've met uh, over the last week or so, about how hard working you are and the quality of your work. So I'll endorse that right here. But before we get into the first piece of uh, video that you've got for us this morning, is there much chat? Now, you might want to sort of whisper around there, but is there much chat about the whole vaccine stuff or what's, um, what's been the, the general buzz about that? Not really, to be honest. It, ha it hasn't been a, a big talking point whatsoever. It didn't really come up in the, the preview night at all. I think people have been happy enough to, to forget about it a little bit because I guess when you have an All-Ireland final to talk about and worry about and look ahead to, you're not actually thinking about mm. the negative connotations to it. I guess that comes from being a supporter of a county and you put yourself into throwing people's shoes. You're probably not going to get carried away with the whole vaccine thing. I presume it was a massive talking point in the build-up to the Kerry game. I'm not going to lie, though. It does feel like old news. It does feel like this isn't important. And like you talk about people maybe around the county not wanting Tyrone to win. Like I think that exists in, in any given year. Like I'm, I'm not necessarily sure why that is. But I think this year it is hammered home by uh, the, the, the vaccine situation. Now, some people are taking the negativity from them, from this perception that they pulled the bull over Kerry's eyes or something in the semi-final. I would reject that wholeheartedly. And I think uh, anybody who is backing against them or not supporting them this weekend because of that element of the whole situation, I think that's a little bit unfair on Tyrone, to be quite honest yeah. with you. But of course, people have their reasons for, 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 um, for, for, for not getting behind this Tyrone team when it comes to the vaccination yeah. situation. Because we, we know that uh, people maybe have, have opted against it for the, the sake of, being fresh for training because it has been a mad few months for them. And everybody can hide under the cloak of, you know, we want Mayo to win because of the curse. That's that's the uh, that's the overt reason we can give for it. You did that Game of Thrones tour, didn't you, a couple of years ago. Is, what's to, is yeah. Tyrone, what, what, has it got links with Game of Thrones or is this just a bit of, bit of crack in the wall? A bit, bit of crack in the, the wall. I, I'm, as far as I'm aware, there wasn't much of, or any of Game of Thrones filmed in Tyrone. It was all County Antrim and and counted down, wasn't it? So I, I stand corrected if, if that's Well, I mean, look, at if you'd just done a tour on and paid any attention to what you were doing a couple of years ago, you'd you'd be able to answer that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, Tyrone was, was not a county we were brought to on our bus tour a few years ago. I've done multiple Game of Thrones tours, Adrian. You know, it's, it's one <laughs> topic that me you come to me this morning on and I'm a actually good okay. Own, you're front and centre. Here, you're very fresh, by the way. I'm really astonished by... How do you manage... What's your secret to drinking 10 pints the night before and... and appearing so fresh at half seven of a Friday morning? Not drinking 10 pints, pints the night before is probably the, the secret to that. Uh, like it was, it was, I, I did, I did have one last night. I'm not going to lie when I was uh, watching the, um, watching the festivities unfold at Healy Park. We'll, we'll show you a bit of that in a while. Yeah. Basically at Healy, at Healy Park, just to give this a little bit of context before we play the clip because it may seem, it may, it may seem a little bit random, but it, it was essentially a sound check for what was the Tyrone music car. And I've been told that this music car is a big thing that uh, is part of the, the Tyrone match. They drove in front of the team bus in the 2018 final and uh, on Garda Sheikh Hana down below weren't too happy with the fact that uh, they, they had essentially given, uh, they'd cordoned off roads and stuff for what they thought was a team bus, but actually it was just this, this music car that was driving around. So it was there in Healy Park last night. They were getting the, the, the records up and running and giving it a, a bit of a lash last night. It was a totally sort of random evening where you're chatting to, to random punters, but then you're also chatting to people like Peter Canavan, who, who was there last night as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier on, we went out to Ard Bow to speak to, to Patsy Hagen, who has uh, written and performed a couple of poems, especially for this year's All-Ireland Final. And it doesn't hurt as well that it's on the shores of uh, the biggest lake in, in Ireland. So it's a, it's a glorious setting. It's beautiful. Let's take a look at some of the build-up. Dedicated funds, Pat's plan has something to repair. 
my kingdom that did come, but their will it was not done. So we pay mighty mayo and cook bar. Say, I'm on your hands with your dedicated fans. Give us something special to remember. Show them all all I'm day. Not only is it the biggest day maybe in, in the GAA calendar, it's, it's the biggest day in the Irish sporting calendar for, for many. And, you know, it's not every year thrown around the all Ireland final. And what it does do, it brings back memories of your own days playing. And, uh, you know, how privileged we were, first of all, to get that opportunity to play. I know before me, there's a lot of men put in so much effort and, and, and didn't get that opportunity. So, look, I know what the boys are going through. I know what it means to them. And uh, you know, just for for anybody that's involved in in the GA up here, it's it's certainly special times, and uh, we just have to make the most of it. We've lost one or two as well, and uh, and I know what that's like. So uh, it's important we get over the line. But uh, look, we didn't expect to be here in the first place, and uh, we're enjoying the crack and the buzz that comes with the the razzmatazz that comes with an All Ireland final, and uh, we'll let the boys knuckle down and and get on with the hard work. We are, we are standing now in the in the old cross of Arbo, the the ancient ruins there beside us, uh, the, the chapel, the old church. The cross you'll see as you come back down again, 18 feet high. Uh, my back here is to the loch. Loch near, uh, very, it's about 22 mile long by about 8 mile wide. You know, and it touches five counties. So it's a very, it's a place of great history, you know, a lot of history to, to this place. We're counting, we're talking about Derry, Antrim, County Down, there's only a couple of shorelines of County Down. Armagh and of course Tyrone. They, them, them four counties, their biggest shorelines will touch it. They say there's only a couple, maybe three shorelines in, in County Down that, that touches the law here. But as, as I say, it's, it's a place that people come here in the evening time just for for peace of mind, you know, there's something about it. You know, and I, I live beside it, and, and people that would visit here, they'd say, as a most part, you take this place for granted. I don't. I, I think it's a beautiful place, you know, especially in the evening time. If you get a nice evening, you couldn't want to be in a, to me, to be in a nicer place, you know. Well, I was excited, you know, 2018, uh, the fact that I got there, but we we probably knew it, it was going to, be, take a massive performance for us to beat Dublin and Dublin to be well below par. Um, this is different. We've, we've beat one of the favourites to, to get here now and we're up against the Mayo side and there's very little. I know they are slight favourites in the bookies but there's very little. I, I see it and most people see it as a 50-50 game. So you have a, a real possibility of winning it. So I suppose that uh, is exciting or, you know, from our point of view as well. It's going to be one hell of a final between Tyrone and Mighty Mayo. If I could get me hands on a ticket, be God, I believe I would go. They are two of my favourite counties. Tyrone, of course, coming first. Though them, me old lads, can play football. But there's a rumour that they have been cursed. Oh, it's maybe only a rumour and someone is spreading a lie. They say, say that Sam will elude them till some old creator does die. So, God, I'm asking a favour. If there's a chance this rumour is true, if this old fella is still with us, God spare them another week, maybe two. The atmosphere in Tyrone this week is unbelievable. I can't believe what I'm looking at. With, uh, when I pass two different wee villages and see so many flags and emblems up and wishing all the Tyrone lads all the best, it's fantastic to see and it's so juvenating that uh, I've been driving through so many villages and I'm not, I, I can't believe what I'm looking at. So I come down through Oma tonight and the St Nandes lads put up all the flags and it's just unbelievable to see it. We're going to have a great day on Saturday. Do you just leave Dara alone all week? Um, absolutely. He doesn't listen much to what I say. He keeps himself anyway, so um, there, there's no problems in that front. He's definitely not overcoached. Um, and he's in with a great setup. There's There's a lot of good coaches in the throne set up at the minute and there's a lot of instruction being given when they go to training sessions so he doesn't need to listen to anymore when he comes home. It's going to be tough opposition. Our boys will be put to the test for those boys they showed they are no slouches, them buckles that come from the west. For the dubs they thought they'd roll over but Mayo simply would not. Six in a row as far as you'll go. 
you must be content with your lot. And there's not another team in the country could have done what them fellas to do, defied all the odds in the bookies and conquered that army of blue. I'm very proud, and I'm very proud of, uh, of Fergal Logan and Brian Duhur. They've done a fantastic job, and, uh, and them only in the job short time. But they have a, very, have a lot of experience, and they've played great football themselves. So they, they have been round the mill several times, and they're great lads to, to lead the team. I, I just love to be on the team. Now, our boys took care of the kingdom, another team that shouldn't be beat. Spillane needs to watch his blood pressure for he's getting himself into a state. He's more concerned about COVID, who has a job and the ones that have not. I swear the way he's behaving, the man, he's losing the plot. Now, he knows his stuff about football, there's, but there's a wee fact he seems to forget. While well, Logan, for sure, is one couture, but his mate is a well-qualified vet. For he has our men on ball steroids. They're out grazing now as we speak. Forget about 70 minutes, them boys could run for a week. Now, if some of our players start mooing or growing wee horns in their head, do us to blame, but it's all part of the game. It's all the strange food that they're fed. And our lingus are complaining about Morgan. His long kicks, why they're going so high, they think it's a shame during the game their pilots has refused for to fly. I've said from last week to now, I couldn't make me mind up regarding a winner. I don't see in between the sides. When you try and break down advantages and disadvantages, some teams have an advantage. One team has an advantage in one area, the other in the other. And besides, it's Mayo we're talking about, and they don't do anything in a straightforward manner. Um, so if they're ahead by a few points going, in, going down the, the closing stretch, you can see them allowing throwing the opportunity to come back at them. And Throne haven't been good at closing out games. We struggled against Manon, we struggled against Kerry. We nearly let a five-point lead slip. So uh, I see a few big, big calls being made at, at the end and, and there could be very little to separate them and we might have to come back the following week to decide the winner. Come on, you red hands, where your dedicated fans Do your turn and open our heart Mighty men, we are up against Mayo This is now the final show but that's enough of the nonsense. A big flag now has to be made. The wife says she's got me a ticket and the bed and breakfast is paid. So we're heading off to Dublin. We're supporting Tyrone, as you know. And if we're a bit, she will still celebrate with those gallant lads from Mayo. Come on, Tyrone. That is absolutely cracking stuff. I really enjoyed that poem particularly. I think that's some of Vaughan's best work there that he's done over the last few weeks. Bit of a flavour of what was going on in Oma last night across uh, Loch Nair. Loch Nair. <laughs> Obviously that poem uh, was off the charts. The uh, line our boys took care of the kingdom, they said they couldn't be bait. I think might have been amongst my favourite. It was a cracker on. He was in uh, top form. Yeah, he was. And uh, Pat Blan getting yet another dig from the people of Tyrone by a poem form this time. If there's, like what's the, the Simpsons mean, the stop he's already dead meme, that's Pat Spillane on the ground and the county of Tyrone huddled around him and they just will not stop. And you know what, he's, he, he gave them enough of it, I think, in the build-up to the semi-final. Loved it. What was his name? That was Patsy Hagen uh, out, Patsy. In, out in Ardbo. But uh, I, I said earlier on that it's the same club as the McGuigans. Crucially not the same club as the McGuigans. He, uh, the same sort of parish, but a different club. So... Uh, in case Patsy Hagen is uh, listening, I apologise for that different club, same area. Uh, he'll be watching us on, he'll be out and join the viewer on Loch Ness this morning. It sounds cracking. Um, come here, D, just obviously in relation to the, the, the team and reading a little bit about the dynamic of it and how they come about, and there's a lot of stock been put in the, was it the 2017 Sigerson team? Um, play, there's like 10 players in the squad that, that came through that, and obviously the, the facilities, and the, this is not by chance that all this stuff has come about. Absolutely not. And we'll hear about that in our next piece this morning, that this is a, a really well thought out, well planned setup. And I think it does kind of go back to the 2000s a little bit. That really gave the county the belief that not only can they contend, but they can be the best team in the country and sustain that for a period of time. That necessary sense of superiority, which led to a lot of resources being poured into the county, which led to the development of the Garbahi complex, which led to a really well thought out plan. There was actually a question last night at that roadshow in Healy Park about 
I know I, I'm not sure they come to the conclusion, but they, they think that every single member of this backroom team is from Tyrone. It's very hard to, to kind of decipher because backroom teams are so ginormous, but they think that every single member of the backroom team is actually from the county. So this is an entirely self-sustained charge that they've made this year. We'll hear, we'll hear from uh, Damien in just a moment, who is the coaching officer, but he makes the point that it's so important about keeping your coaches in-house and making no bones about the fact that when Ryan McMenamin is coaching in Fermanagh, when Peter Canavan is coaching in a, in, in a different county, that it's okay to feel a little bit jealous about that. It is okay to think, how do we get Peter Canavan back? How do we get Ryan McMenamin back? It's been a big theme for a lot of counties over the last seven years about do we appoint an external manager or do we try and appoint somebody who knows the county a little bit more. Tyrone have certainly gone for the latter and it's worked a treat really. Yeah. Um, Kerry's been doing it for years obviously I, it strikes me that Brian Swanson had those purple things going on a couple of years ago you've got every uh, local business around the Oma area driving their vans past you now with a little bit of branding and sure listen why wouldn't you it's uh, it's the week for it right you've mentioned Damien Harvey coaching officer with Toronto GA and you were chatting to him last night okay we are here in one of the dressing rooms in Healy Park with Tyrone GA coaching officer, but more importantly, friend of the pod, Golf Weekly, uh, fully paid subscriber, Damien Harvey. How are you getting on? Absolutely, and uh, it's. Um, I'm looking forward to the new deal on the the pod for next year. I hear I hear it's very, going to be very very competitive. Um, I'm a wee bit worried that Nathan uh, isn't going to make the cut, but given the fact that he's uh, he declared a handicap of about 29 or something the other day, so. Uh, once he's down to you know mid teens, we'll maybe we'll maybe get him out in a, one of these big big competitions. Uh, between Mayo and Tyrone, Nathan Murphy has come up in conversation so much. So I think we've uh, stroked his ego enough. We do want to talk to you about this Tyrone team. For a lot of people on the outside looking in, Damien, this is uh, a team that have kind of come from nowhere. But from the inside looking in, I presume you saw this coming. Well, I think it's fair to say that obviously with the change in management. Um, the expectation levels would have been there, hopefully, to win an Ulster Championship in the near future. Um, they've done that in year one, um, and this is very much seen as a brand new project within their own. Uh, so it's, it's brilliant to get it was brilliant to get the Ulster Championship, um, brilliant to retain status in Division One, but to get to another Ireland final, I think, is probably beyond expectations actually this year, uh, given the fact that these guys are the, the management team were just are, are on the scene. Um, but obviously the lads have fully bought into it and um, yeah, all Ireland final and it's, it's, it's a brilliant occasion and a, a, a real fillip for the whole for the whole county. What is your strategy from a coaching officer's standpoint then to ensure that this is the beginning of something? Well, I suppose <laughs> that would have, it's, it's, it's unending because, because uh, obviously we're looking at what we're going to be trying to do with our academy teams this, this winter, um, try to get them up and running. Obviously, we'll give, we give a lot of time to the clubs this year. Uh, we didn't take out uh, any of the, of the lads, underage lads this year at all, bar, from the, bar the throw minors. So we'll definitely be looking at a strategy over the winter to try and get the academies back up and running again. And, uh, but obviously, there's a few things we need to put in place structurally. Um, and probably financially, in order to make that happen. People think there's an unending um, conveyor belt of, of talent in Tyrone. But that's not always the case. You have to work really, really hard, as we've seen other counties do. Um, and, you know, none more so than us, because it's all right having a team in the All-Ireland final, but there has to be another generation coming behind it, or else you're going to be in the doldrums for a while after. Can you try and explain how you manage to ensure that? What, what are the practical steps you take to try and ensure that there is a generation coming behind us? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the quality of coaching that you put in um, and the calibre of people that you, you have involved. Um, Academy Tyrone, uh, under the sort of new restructure a few years ago, put really good quality people in. Some of them have drifted away. And it's important that we look for you know another, uh, or some of the same guys actually to return. I know that there's conversations ongoing around that at the minute. Uh, and we want to try and attract a really high calibre of coach back into the system. And that means some of those are ex-county men um, and some of them are just really, really good coaches. Uh, and um, that's, that's what it's about. It's about making sure that the clubs, when they look at the coaching that's available in the Toronto GA, realise that it's a higher calibre than, you know, as high a calibre as possible. 
Uh, and if you can do that and you can put that structure in place, you've got a chance. That's really interesting because that is a theme that a lot of counties are grappling with at the moment, the idea of appointing external managers. There's sort of an instant gratification element to it. Sometimes it leads to real success. Is there a real case to be made, though, that trying to appoint coaches from within the system does lead to longer-term benefits? Absolutely. It has to. It has to. You, see, you see the current Tyrone set up at the minute. You know, you have the likes of Collie Holmes, Joe McBahan in the background, helping out with Fergal and, and Brian. Uh, and the, you know that that's what it's all about. Peter Donnelly, ex-county player as well, involved in the strength and condition, doing an absolutely superb job. Uh, and that's the quality that you, you want involved. And uh, I suppose when the clubs in Tyrone see that, and when the young players see that, then that's what it's about. Uh, you know, going external is the easy route. But I know a number of counties, you know, feel that they have to do that to get themselves up the ladder. But here in Tyrone, it's about trying to develop from within. And we know that there's enough quality players who have taken the jersey, got out onto the field, and, and done it in the past. And who better to learn from than, than those guys? That's what it's all about. The thing is, there's obviously only one senior manager's job. When people like Ryan McMenamin or Peter Canavan are coaching, as I don't want to just pick out for manor managers here, but they're the two that, that, that come to mind, do you try and tap into what they're learning from another county? Do you, do you make long-term uh, appeals to them to try and come back within the fold? Or, or how, how does that dynamic work? Absolutely, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to attract these guys back into the system again. But obviously, they need to see that there's a, that there's a longer-term structure in place and that there's opportunities to go in and maybe take an academy team and develop into maybe take a, a throw minor team, an under-21 team, and maybe, maybe someday take the senior team as well. They need to be able to see that. And uh, maybe we haven't been as good as we could have been with that in the past. Um, and certainly, I say, before you can attract that quality of coach, you need to have ensure there's a system in place. We're grappling a wee bit of that at the minute, um, and we have to get we have to get that right. Once we get that right, we have a chance, and then we can start, you know, looking at the next generation coming behind. Obviously, good good strides made in the last couple of years in terms of getting the throne throne miners into an All Ireland final this year again, which was a very important step for us. Um, and the fact that under 21s won the, the Ulster Championship recently. Not two distance past either. So those those are really really important building blocks and, and building stones for the future. Uh, and that's I say that's what we're trying to achieve. But uh, we just we're, we're we're grappling to make sure that we get these we get, get these boys recycled back into the system because we want them going out to. We're more than happy for them to go out to other counties for a while. But we need them here. We need them back, and we're we're mad keen to get them back. Yeah, and I don't know, there's no shame in saying that either. People sometimes dance around that subject, and I think it's pretty obvious that people would love all these greats of the game to come back. It's interesting that you mentioned the, the underage success. Saturday is the 2015 Under-21 Champions against the 2016 Under-21 Champions, so Mayo and Tyrone, there's a similarity there in terms of bringing that generation through. Is there anything you've learned down through the years in terms of stuff that works and stuff that doesn't work when you're taking through a crop of talented youngsters? Well, I don't think you can look for immediate success with them. Uh, Obviously, even from the way they've changed the minor system, a lot of people disagree with, and I disagree with myself. The fact that it's under 17, um, it's the, the step up from 17 to maybe even 20, to under 20, and certainly into senior, you don't make that step anymore. Very rarely do you see a 17-year-old step into a senior jersey at 18 years of age. Um, so that 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 dynamic or that getting that pre preparation of a senior team does take time to develop and you're only seeing these guys really start to come together now it's taken probably six years you know since that since that all ireland title um, but now you're seeing a very mature and developed footballer and you know there's another generation coming pushing at their heels as well um, uh, and you know like Connor mckenna coming back in from australia is a massive uh, a boost for the county as well delighted to see him the fact that Cahill McShane opted against going to australia to play for throne shows you that the you know the esteem in which that county jersey does still hold for, for our players. And uh, it, I think it's incumbent upon everybody that's involved in any county board, or, or particularly our own county board, to try and do everything they can to work to keep these lads you know, still at that same level. Because I think sometimes we can take it for granted, but the amount of workload that those guys have to go through you know, to get to play at this level is, uh, is really, really, it's, it's hard work. And we have to be as supportive as possible. Can I ask then, out of curiosity, uh, Fergal Logan and, uh, and Brian Dewher, how much autonomy do they have in terms of overhauling the system, bringing in coaches? Do, do they have final say on everything? Because again, if you're looking at other counties, we often hear stories of county boards imposing what they want on a, on a management. 
No, Fergal Logan and Brian De are appointed, and it's their job to put the structures in place that they need to to, to deliver for Tyrone. And um, you know, I think the county board try and stay out of it as much as possible. But uh, I'm sure then, when the, the finance sheets are looked at, there, there may be people with other opinions. But um, ultimately, it's the job of the Tyrone senior management team to put the structure in place around them that's, that's required to deliver. And uh, that's what Fergal and Logan and uh, Brian Dehurst seem to have done well, they have done at this stage because they've got us through to all Ireland final. And as far as we're concerned, it's bonus territory. When it comes to centre of excellences, then I think Garvahi is probably the most famous one uh, in the country. I don't know why that is, but it's a phenomenal facility. There's no question about that. How do you utilise that to the, to the best of its ability, and how do you ensure that you get the best out of your coaches with that sort of facility? Well, it is. It's a remarkable facility, and it's taken a lot of hard effort and work and a good bit of vision to try and get it put in place. Um, I suppose and a, a lot of uh, that credit must go to our fundraising committee, uh, Club Throne Fundraising Committee, who have gone out and lifted significant sums of money uh, from people all around the world, um, Throne people uh, who, have, who have put their hands in their pockets and have supported Throne GA and put that building and put that facility in place. But the, I suppose the really important thing is that everybody feels a buy into, into it. And I think sometimes Sometimes people can look at it and say, "Well, that's just not for me. It, it's you know, it doesn't. It's not my part of the GA, or it doesn't feel like my part of the GA." So there's a body of work again we need to do from from our perspective to make people realise that that facility that's at Gervahi is for everyone, not just the, the the extraordinary player. It's for every for all our players, and there's work to be done. There's no doubt uh, about that. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we have, a, have an excellent facility up there that we can take our county teams. And this year, thankfully, uh, we've, uh, it was passed that, uh, earlier in the year that the, the ladies and uh, Camogues now you, you also use that facility free of charge, which is fantastic. And in this age of equality, that's exactly what you want. Do club teams get in there, like pre-COVID? Uh, no, the club teams, some club teams would have been using it just to, as a facility maybe to train pre-season and so on, but uh, in the main it's, it's mainly a county facility uh, and you know, we should be able to, we should be opening it up to more, to more people. Um, that's, again, that's something that has to be, has to be tackled and, 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 and sorted out because uh, we do want to open it up as much as possible and I suppose whenever people are coming up to with dropping off kids for academy teams and so on, we want them to feel as, as you know that that's, that's their building and it is their building. It's not it's not a it's not a management committee or a Tyrone GA county committee building. It's the, it's a building for the Gales of Tyrone and uh, and and Ulster uh, and in, in terms of a wider use because obviously we want it to be used for our schools Ulster schools competitions as well. Very interesting. Well, Damien, it was great chatting to you. Do you think Tyrone are going to do it on, on Saturday? Ach, listen, um, I was listening to your conversations last week about the, the power rankings and I know Jerry Gilroy was on having a chat with you as well trying to convince you that uh, Never listen to Jerry Gilroy's rule number one that Tyrone should probably be a little higher than fourth and Kerry been second, um, you know what we're just delighted to be there and uh, so we'll see how it goes They might even be up to number one if they win on Saturday do you know what? I have a feeling they'll never be number one with you, Owen, but uh, sure, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, and, uh, Jerry, you're right. Uh, I think uh, Throne GA, Throne, uh, definitely team of, the, team of the naughties, team of the decade. <laughs> we will not open that kind of worms right now because I want to get out of here alive. Uh, great to chat to you, Damien. Thanks a million. All the best. Thanks. You'll have no choice, Owen, but uh, to lash them up there on uh, come Monday morning, you'll have no option if they win it. It'll be a big jump. Yeah, well, like uh, we, we never really, because there was obviously an actual game to talk about a couple of weeks ago, but Pat Spillane jumping ship on the whole team of the decade thing pre the Kerry Jerome game was an absolute disgrace. Like, I mean, I, I understand why he did it, because he wanted to butter up Sean Kavanagh before laying into the team, or he wanted to show some sort of balance in his Tyrone view. But that was an absolute disgraceful uh, abandoning of all his values, I thought, and uh, I don't think that got enough airtime. Have you been waiting till like, you're standing in the middle of a moment to bring up this conversation? That's a good point. Like, I mean, it's <laughs> I mean I'm happy to get into we, Let's get into it if you want. <laughs> uh, we, leave, we leave that one off. Come here, but, uh, what, yeah. One thing I wanted to mention, you sort of uh, struck me, listening to the conversation there with Damien, that um, the structures that have been put in place and like you were saying about the influence of the managers that are there, it, it shouldn't uh, detract, obviously, from the fact that like, it now looks like the parting of the ways with Mickey Hart 
uh, also was a bit of a masterstroke. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a universal. This is this is definitely going to work for them. The two lads come in and they have a bit of experience, obviously at the underage and a bit of club. But this is a huge step up. Um, the structures that have been put in place are very important, and they will obviously serve the development of players um, and the progress of the team generally. Would assume, particularly with that that facility, but. Uh, not to detract from the what the two lads have brought to the party. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really good point. I think that you can't really make an argument against the fact that it was the right decision to move past the Mickey Hart era. Like even when you listen to show, someone like Sean Cavanagh speak, there is the sense of regret that maybe it didn't happen a little bit sooner, and mm. that this sort of transition didn't happen maybe during his last couple of years. But then again, Mickey Hart was coming up against the greatest team of all time, and even with Dewar and Logan at the helm things wouldn't have gone any differently in terms of the All-Ireland medal count. So the timing of these lads coming in is also perfect, let's not forget. It is a great time to be coming in to any setup at the top tier of inter-county football because you know that there may be an easier All-Ireland feud than there would have been during the, the peak Jim Gavin over Dublin era. But it's not taking away anything from what Dewar and, and Logan have done. They have reinvigorated certain players that looked like they were dead when it came to inter-county, their inter-county careers under, uh, under Mickey Harris. They have discover players that we hadn't heard of before. And I think that they deserve huge credit for the way they've managed to tap into all different areas of the county as well. There is such a spread uh, of different clubs across the team. The same goes for Mayo, in fairness. And I think, actually, when we get into the analysis of this game, there are so many similarities between what Duhur and Logan are doing and what James Horan has tried to do, especially during his second stint in charge. Yeah, and whether or not uh, the two lads pull off uh, Stephen Kenny and include Derek Canavan at the weekend, I presume, <clears throat> is a big talking point as well. Seems to be a lot of nods from Mark Bradley, though. I think so, and I think the uh, Derek Canavan shout, that was Andy on the football pod, wasn't it? It he, was Andy, was and, and Stephen Rochford is talking about it in the Star this morning as well, yeah. Right, OK, that's Our Paddy, it might have been, actually, yeah. That's, that, that is interesting, because... I guess what it, when it comes down to the analysis, and it's going to be interesting to see what the lads are thinking quick fix later on, but it is an impossible one to call. But yeah. one of the reasons why it's an impossible one to call is that it's impossible to know what curveballs are going to be played. And really, is it a curveball if Derek Canavan starts? I mean, it's hard to pick Tyrone's starting team anyway. Nobody really knows what's going to happen anyway. So maybe, the, maybe it is so up in the air that every ball we're going to see is a curveball anyway. I don't know. Like, I, I think Andy McGinley used the point that it's like throwing a deck of cards up in the air and seeing where they land when it comes to the matchups. And I think there's a certain element that's kind of the same when it comes to the, to the team selection and certainly the positional uh, selections tomorrow. It's a, it's a fascinating sort of uh, under a, a mysterious cloak sort of All-Ireland final. And it's not something I think we've, we've experienced in, in recent memory. Yeah, the team naming is going to be absolutely fascinating. And I think that like... Also yeah. pointless. Yeah, and like Canavan, <laughs> Derek Canavan looks like he's literally been born like watching him the last day to play on that stage, I, you look at him and just think, how the hell could you leave this guy out? But um, look at it, they, they have options and it means that they have depth and we will see how it all plays out and you've loads more coming as well. Uh, thanks for the minute, on, Good man. Cheers, Adrian. You're watching OTB AM. We're live in association with uh, Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We've a pack show coming for you between now and 10 a.m. this morning. We'll give you a bit of a sense of that. We've obviously just been bringing you all that to our own build up over the last half hour. There about to be lots more to come. Uh, Damien Harvey, we've just heard from there a couple of moments ago, to our own coaching officer and friend of the pod, as he was telling known as well. Bogue, uh, Declan Bogue, and Enda McGinley. They're in absolutely cracking form, watching a little bit of that earlier on, and uh, they're going to talk to Owen in a few minutes' time. Uh, we'll bring you the sports pages, some interesting stories there. Jonathan Hill's take on whether Stephen Kenny should uh, stay or go, and a few other bits and bobs as well across the back pages. More we'll bring you very shortly. The quick picks, it'll be our last one of the year, and I have to say it's the one that I've uh, wrangled over the most as to which way... Um, I would fall on it so that is uh, coming your way at a quarter to nine we'll preview the Camogie finals this weekend and the company of Sarah O'Donovan that's just after nine Vera Pau obviously out in front of the media yesterday with that big announcement from Sky and their sponsorship shirt sponsorship of the women's national team that's at 20 past nine and John Giles 
in conversation with Nathan from last night's show. That's as well on the way from half past nine. Lots of comments, by the way, coming into us this morning. And good morning to everybody who's been uh, dropping in some of those comments on YouTube and beyond as well. Um, it, including one from uh, Dara Tool wondering uh, who knows which players will be described as testicles this morning by AB and it wasn't I mean I'm glad that you've actually properly represented the point I was making as opposed to describing the entire county when we were talking a couple of weeks ago but nobody's in the firing line uh, certainly in that way at least anyway this morning Dara but good morning to you and thanks a million for dropping in we're going to come uh, back after these very special sit down interview uh, on in the company of Enda McGinley and Declan Bogue OTB AM this is OTB Sports Radio. The Premier League on OTB. Son still has a couple of little step overs onto his left foot. Send it into the back of the net. And listen to the roar around this stadium. Young men's son. Left footed from the edge of the area. Put Spurs in front against the champions. Who needs Harry Kane when you've got young men's son? It's Tottenham 1, Manchester City now. Exclusive Premier League live commentaries every Sunday. The very best expert analysis on your phone and for free. Download the OTB Sports app now. John is always running. It's a long drive to Croker from here. In ways even longer for the fans. The effort, I can tell you, it's worth it. Even today, I can still hear it. The roar of the hill. It's going to be something else. OTB. AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. I don't know if I'd be entirely right in saying there was a massive buzz in 2018. I think there was a wee bit of excitement, all right. But uh, if you look at the the matchup, like you know, Tron came in, and that was was the first year of the Super Eights, so that was a novelty. They'd beaten Donegal up in Ballybuffet, which was the first time that had happened since I think 1972, or whatever. Uh, they had. Uh, they had a bench. There was similarities in some ways. Kieran McGeary was coming off the bench. Harry Lochran was another one who was coming off the bench at the time. Like so, the, the the last twenty minutes had a great sort of arsenal to unload at the time. But I think though, just because they played Dublin and Oma, and they really, I think they went after that game, and they narrowed the pitch, of course, too for Stephen Cluxton's kickouts. They did every trick. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. Uh huh. So. You're narrowing the pitch for the kickouts, as you said, as Emma said, and uh, you throw everything at that one game in, in Oma to try and get that, but they didn't. They didn't win that game. Um, and I think then once they were in a final against Dublin, there was a little bit of a thought, I it's it's great to be back in an Ireland final, but I'm not sure, I'd say the most rabid throne fans, if they truly believe uh, they're going to win. I, I don't think the buzz was the same, but I would put that, the primary thing, I would nearly put that down. We'd beat Monaghan in the semi-final in 2018 wasn't it mm -hmm. in in Croak and for Trone to get over Monaghan that's something we'd done regularly that didn't really it wasn't a famous victory it wasn't a famous performance uh, going back to previous years when we won it like 03 obviously it was the victory against Kerry that just put rocket fuel in the county mm -hmm. and it is so similar this time around like the victory against Kerry this time the way that match was set up with Kerry so strong favourites and our boys never really showing what they showed against Kerry, like the way they played, uh, was massive. And that alone, it has the, the pride people felt mo walking away from Crook Park, just the way the boys had played, the way they'd represented the county. And even you can sense it again, just there's something about Tyrone. And when Tyrone are at their best, that's what you want to say. It's, it's not necessarily about brilliant football or at. But whenever Trone can play with that edge and play with that real passion, I think that's our A game. And we brought it massively against against Kerry. And with that, I think the thing is ignited. Like the difference after the Ulster final, there was no huge excitement after the Ulster final. Then you put the two things hand in hand. Dublin going out obviously has lifted every county, uh, not just the ones remaining in the in the competition, but even every county outside of that. So everybody's that wee bit more excited oh. than uh, to take down Kerry. I think that has finished the deal for Trone and, and there is a, a massive, massive buzz uh, now with the team. How did you guys manage to tap into that buzz in a positive way in the 2000s? I suppose in 2000 we, we were, again, and this would be my both 
issue with our own team, the team that I was part of in terms of the naughties and where, where we failed. And yet it was also our greatest calling card was we love playing on the edge. We love playing when the deck seems stacked against us. We love playing when there was a point to prove, when there was doubts there. And each of our all Irelands that was characterised by that sort of story un underlying it. Uh, then we lost. That was a great team. And yet we lost plenty of all Irelands to teams that were not particularly great teams. They were. We, we lost. We went out of the championship to Leash, to Mayo, who weren't a, a big team at that stage. Uh, Meath we, we lost as well. You know, so... That team, whenever we didn't have that, we were bang ordinary. Uh, and unfortunately, the real top teams, the likes of what Dublin have done, and even I looked at that Kerry team too, they were more able to be there all of the time. And yet we needed this special thing for us to really reach the pitch of our game. Now, what I would say is whenever we really reached the pitch of our game, we were the best team. There was nobody could touch us. But my problem is the really top teams can play with a level of consistency and don't have to have that real backs against the wall mentality. But it works, and it worked brilliantly in the semi-final against Kerry. Uh, and the boys got that edge. And I suppose the challenge for Trone as a county in the future, please God, if we can add all irons, is become more mature and be able to reach a high playing level without that same chip on the shoulder thing. But when it's there and it's working, we'll, be, we'll, we'll play with it for another while. Absolutely. When you talk about the deck being stacked, uh, Declan, it seems that if you look at the bookmakers and the Mayo media, uh, it's stacked in Mayo's favour this weekend. So when you're looking through some of the sports pages in Tyrone over the past couple of days, do they disagree with that? Well, there's there's always going to be a partisan, you know, uh, leaning for your own readership. Uh, that's just a given. Like, um, But even, you know, what they've done here and some of the papers have been kind of clever here. Like, there's this is the... Ulster Hurl, <clears throat> they have good, a uh, pretty big supplement here, but I'm not sure whether I saw it in this or in another newspaper, but um, it was, they've gone and got <clears throat> national uh, journalists to do their predictions. So they've kind of, uh, like I'm looking here and there's a lot of good content, there's a lot of good features, right? Uh, there's your Mayo features and Throne features and one in the back room now. But they've gone and got Michael Foley from the Sunday Times, John Fogarty from the Examiner and Dermot Crow from the Sunday Independent to give their verdict, which I think is kind of clever because yeah. there's only so many times that you can say Throne are going to win and uh, come on Throne and so on. But uh, Michael Foley gives it to Mayo, Fogarty gives it to Mayo and Dermot Crow gives it to Tyrone. So we're never ever going to mention those predictions uh, again, are we? <laughs> <laughs> no matter what happens. But yeah, look, if you were to look through it, it's all sort of nostalgia. There's a big art, you know, McCrory interview. It's, it's ads from their own club wishing the players well. It is, it's, it's get behind the boys' time. Like, and that's what a local newspaper should be. Like, no one's by a local newspaper to read, <clears throat> read a sort of a, a critique on how Tyrone might feel like that would just kill the buzz completely <laughs> like you know because there's been enough opportunity for there's enough media out there and I think that in, in these times now that newspapers have clearly been struggling especially during the pandemic and all that that an awful lot of local newspapers went out of business like there was pretty awful what happened a great deal of them and if you want that critical analysis you want to get into the nuts and bolts and matchups and motivational tools and all that you've got a million podcasts now everyone with a dictaphone in their bedroom has a podcast and is even on the odd one and the the point of this is it's cheerleading and that's good i, I think it's healthy and i guess it creates excitement and <clears throat> i mean and this is kind of a really odd thing for anyone to say but I can still remember uh, the county final previews in the Fermanagh Herald when I was a child, and I can remember what they wrote about certain players. Like, so I remember Davenish played Rosley, whether it be 1991 or 1990, and Mark Gallagher was the, the big young thing, you know, he was about 18, 19, breaking on the Fermanagh team. And I remember that the pen pick said that he was the baby of the team, and he used to wear these white short ankle socks long before you know, anyone was into it. And because now we've got Irish Newspaper Archive, you can look back over all the, the old newspapers. And I looked at it there a few months ago. There it was. It was actually word, word for word as I remembered it. Now, I accept that I might have been a complete nerd, but I think that there's, there's plenty of nerds out there in Toronto that will lift these newspapers, read them, and they'll be drawn into this wonderful world. Mm. I think the mementos too. Like you, yeah. you sort of gather up stuff. I've a bag at home where I've just old stuff. I'll, I'll never look at it. I don't intend looking at it for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, but it's all it captures a real moment in time. And I think these 
look, life's life, but when you get these special moments where there's this whole collective buzz about the place and everybody's talking about only one topic, it's a brilliant time, and given the past year and a half and the dreary sort of news cycle we've had and what's been cancelled and what can't happen and the problems with anything that is happening, it just feels brilliant to be able to get carried away. And I think even for me, I suppose it's the difference. This is sort of the first one that I've really felt truly as a, as a supporter. You just feel completely free of everything and you're just allowing yourself to get carried away in it. And the fact that it's such a 50-50 game and it's we there's no point trying to be super clever about this match. Mm. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Mm. This is going to be mayhem. Or it's going to be mayhem within the four lines of a football pitch and I think it's just all the more exciting for it I think both sets of supporters whenever they rack up in Dublin on Saturday I think the buzz will be just massive yeah absolutely well, what about even and uh, you know your, your children are a bit more further on than, than mine like you know I mean what what does it mean to them like you have your memories in 1989 so on like so what do you think what kind of fire is that igniting in them uh, we were listening to a podcast on the road yesterday coming down the road after collecting tickets up the road. <laughs> it was just everything <laughs> revolving around football. And James was beside me, he's my oldest boy, he's 10, and we are listening to actually the Paddy and Andy podcast in the car. And by the end of it, like it was just clear. Oh, it was, it, <laughs> obviously. And it was, it was completely 50 50. And bar Andy putting out more advertisement for the fact that he wants a job role next year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is there a vacancy in the, in the Antrim setup, do you think? Uh, well, I think. You could have him with him, <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think you have to go through Paddy's wife, or Andy's wife, by the sounds of it. But uh, no, at the end of the pot, it was just so 50 50. And James, you know, he turned to me and he just said, I've never been to a match in my life where it's been so just so close. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And of course, that's the, that's the naivety of youth. But we were in holidays in May over the summer, too. And we're in Supermax in Castle Bar. I was eating a salad. They do a mean salad in oh, Supermax. No but uh, no we're dressing. sitting in Supermax Castle Bar. Bar. And two and fish and chips there. <laughs> <laughs> it was just wall to wall. Every wall was covered with huge murals of just no nothing way. but mayo. And I remember I'd been talking to James about mayo and everyone else down on. And we'd listened to Green and Red and Mayo because we're at Clue Bay and all the rest. So I was going through all that with him. And he was sitting in Supermax and I says... Mayo are really mad about their football, aren't they? <laughs> and I said, yep. And so it turns out we're now playing them. So, you know, it's brilliant for them. It's brilliant for them to hear the story. They're all going in. They've thrown day tomorrow in their schools. There's great buzz. So that lights a wee fire. It is part of what we're all about. You remember those childhood memories as much as you remember a Christmas or a special summer holiday. You remember a special moment for this. So as a parent, to be able to see the children go through that mm. and live that and with... The, the way the throne team played the last day and the way the Mayo team went about the business, you couldn't ask for better values in terms of a football team than that it was about effort, that it was them overcoming the favourites through sheer sort of force of will and desire and the teamwork and everything. So it's, look, it's, it's, it's a win-win as far as I'm concerned, and, but obviously the, the tears will fall all the harder if, if throne don't get over the line on Saturday. Of course. What was that moment for you then in your childhood? In Mayo, actually, 1989. I was eight at the time. Uh, we were on our way down to a family holiday. I think it was in Arklow, and we stopped then in Dublin for the Ireland semi, Throne v Mayo. Uh, and Throne lost that game. I was in the upper deck of the Cusick stand, the old Cusick stand. Uh, and I remember just crying, as you do when you're, when you're that age, crying after the match that Throne lost and thought it was the most unfair thing ever. And uh, That was that. But the rest of the family obviously were a wee bit older and a wee bit wiser, and it was still great you know, to be, to be down there and at it and all, but it was just the heartbreak of it. But that's that's the children and for them they've been used to Dublin they've been they were at the All-Ireland final in Dublin and that, you know it was just such a disappointing day but this one just feels different there feels like such a real chance and it's, they, they can easily pick up the excitement of all the adults too you know so no it's brilliant what's yours what's your earliest sort of moment of uh, like I'm not sure do you have an All-Ireland as a neutral in Croke Park or anything like that? No, there's, there, there, there literally is nothing like that. Um, right. I'm not one of the big day merchants uh, or the event Maybe. junkies, like, but it, I suppose if your question is sort of what ignites your sort of passion yeah. for GM, it's going to be entirely different than most. And that is just uh, where we grew up um, in the country. There was a primary school, our primary school was next door, as in like 250 yards down the road. And that's where my mother used to coach the local camogie club St Matthews and like you know her parents would have been like chair, per, chair people and so on and that and the, the, the championship in Fermanagh was the O'Connor Cup was the name so like that is your earliest memories of for me in the GAA 
and like the area where we're from is actually there was a, a great deal of well it's, it's, it's the only sort of hurling area like but then I had an uncle who played for Enniskill and Gales and uh, captained them to the championship in 87 and I had another uncle on the Bogue side that played for uh, Tampo and was always handy for a wee slippy goal and, and stand around for the rest of the game then but he always got that goal every game so it kept him on week on week on week so and you know he used to left me with the old brown leather, you know, the old brown leather kit bag with a towel and, you know, and a Sunday best coming from Mass after getting my feet of spuds. You know, I don't remember any of that kind of stuff. But so they, they, that's, what, you know, I got to say when it came to Big Days Out, like all I remember, like standing in an old wet bank in Irvistown and watching a bit of a melee, lads from Brookborough fighting, lads from Katie uh, during a Fermanagh Armagh game. I remember being at the, in the athletic grounds the day that Fermanagh were about nine points up with literally five minutes to go and um, Dennis Hollywood got two goals and one of the Grimleys got another goal and I remember walking out of that gate and I clearly can recall like um, you know thank me for saying it but Colin Bradley and he was bawling crying like you know about the, the unfairness and the unjustness of this Raymond Gallagher was a minor and had played the previous week for the minors and had made a senior debut then that day and hit maybe one five and uh, so there was no there, there were no, oh my God, you know, I'm in this big stadium and it's a massive game. It was just an accumulation of tiny little hurts, you know, yeah. di and disappointments. And it stood me in good stead for watching for the rest of the time, really. Can I ask then, what, what's like this sort of week like for you? Because like I smuggled in a copy of Mayo News to County Tyrone and you're, on, you're in the Mayo News, you're in a couple of other publications. I'd imagine... I'm we're, quite young. All their decent journalists are available. Like, you know, are available. One, <laughs> but just not in demand. <laughs> is it, I mean, like, all Ireland final week is not just about the players, Declan. It turns out that uh, other people have to be at the very peak of their condition on a week like this. I oh, know. I've been, I've been doing a lot of um, planking recently now. We're getting ready for this. But I look, it's. I suppose some people might feel because you're in the county, you've got a, a, a measure of insight. Like, and you know, you thankfully you don't get labelled with the oh, he's a, a Toronto journalist. Like, you know, he's just someone who is there and having these conversations. Whatever, you know, I mean, this just just one of those things. It's great to be part of it because it's great to see it close up. And like, you know, we've got children and and and, and God love them. I can't imagine them tomorrow at the throne party wearing their Fermanagh gear. Like, you know, it's going to be very tough for them. But these, this is what you you teach them resilience, don't you? So that's true. That your kids wear Fermanagh gear. No, oh, they'll, okay. they'll not get away with it tomorrow. <laughs> like, it's just it's just going to have to live in Rome. Like, you know, and there was there. My house the other day, and he saw that there was a throne flag flying. Like, so it's for the kids. It's mm. for the kids, you know. Um, for people who don't know, Declan has obviously uh, moved to Tyrone in the the last ten years or so. We'll get into the match in just a moment. But I was saying to you off air that it's actually quite noticeable when you're driving. So I came from Mayo this morning. That there are certain towns in Tyrone that are completely absent of colour, and certain towns in Tyrone that are absolutely full to the brim with colour. So. How have things changed, or are they still the same when it comes to crossing the divide in the community in Tyrone, when it comes to sparking interest in, in this, this year's All-Ireland Final? Look, the political question up here, like it's, it's always going to uh, be buried very, very deep. Uh, it's always there. Uh, so on, days, on times like this, it does come out. But as ever, sport is an easier vehicle. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a political thing up there, although some, some will try and associate the GA with a very political ethos. But uh, So for us, it is very much a, a very positive expression. Uh, there will be those towns that will not be put up, uh, simply because there, there may be more, more the, the unionist out, outlook and wouldn't be as much in the GA. But I know of many, many... Uh, people of a unionist background and they'll be watching this match and they'll be fully aware they'll obviously be fully aware that it's it's going on and they'll be able to hold a uh, firm conversation there will be plenty we'll be sneaking out tickets here and there as well and, and trying to get down as well so look uh, are, are things moving on massively like the, the north thing things move very very slowly particularly on a political thing and people hold dear to, to everything that they're about and no less on in terms of our side and the ga obviously is exceptionally precious and is is maybe even more deeply ingrained so moments like this to compete for an All Ireland final or compete for an All Ireland title which for so long uh, not so long ago just was a very very rare and secondary occurrence uh, it's it's brilliant but those, those differences are there but things are gradually changing and, and thrown in particular like it's it's a fairly it, it's certainly holding the balance of power shall we say in terms of the GA side of things 
Uh, the, but because it's rare too, the, then what happens is, you know, because of the rare stories are wonderful. And I can remember when um, Fermanagh reached the Ulster final in, in 2008 in Tempo. Uh, they had Orange Mounting up because the, the Orange March was taking place that year, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, the arrangement was then with someone from the local Orange Lodge that uh, when Fermanagh got to the final that, you know, the, 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 the Orange people would have their parade but then they would take their bunting down. But at the same time as they were punt taking their bunting down, they were using a cherry picker. And they were punting for mana bunting up then. So they were untying your, your red, white, and blue uh, streamers and whatever else, untying on green and white at the same time, too, by sharing a cherry picker. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, going back even further than that, like you went down one. Ulster titles in hurling. Like, and I remember just reading that, having a wee look over the revolution years again, because um, their former manager, Sean McGuinness, there passed away last week. And there was a brilliant yarn where the Lord Provost of Down uh, sent a letter congratulating Down hurlers and said, like, I particularly admire, I think it might have been Kieran McGeehan's father, like, you know, or, or one of the players. And, I say, and, and the line was, uh, I used to notice, that I used to see him stealing, trying to steal pheasants on my property as a child, <laughs> you know, it was, just, uh, it was in the actual uh, documentation, but I, I know, like, what Anna says is right, like, it does move slow, but if you take, for example, the time that the Moy won the All-Iron Intermediate, was it 2017 against them, um, and Gail talked in the final, yeah. uh, like, you know, they, they had a number of Protestants that were part of their panel. Like, you know, even our old local club there in, in Atnacloy Ahalu, there are a number of different people with different religions, and, and a lot of them had none whatsoever, too, and that can't be forgotten. Like, some lads wouldn't be, would be a fairly stranger to a, an aisle in the church or a basket, I can tell you. But, you know, what you find is the more that you, the more exposure that people get to GA, and what it actually is, like, rather than you know, the aims and the ethos and point one point two about the United Ireland part, right? If you took that out of the rule book, it's my firm conviction that nobody would truly care. It wouldn't affect anybody. But it would do an awful probably it would probably do an awful lot of good because you get columnists who are just tub thumpers and they're constantly on like they they know this rule far better than ninety nine percent of GA people because it's a stick to beat them with. And um like, you know, whatever about aspirations towards a political solution to whatever we have, because it just doesn't work right now, uh, you know, I think that the GA has to, it has to be seen as something apart again from that, rather than being dragged into any kind of debates or, you know, you, you know at the end of the day, there's only two uh, organisations that organise themselves on a 32 county basis in Ireland, that's Orange Order and the GA. And like, you know, there's certain things that we just should let go and i mean that the, the the bigotry or the kind of um envy or whatever it is with you like it is it is pointless and a self-defeat and for anyone that kind of practices it Declan Bogue in conversation with uh, Owen there and Enda McGinley alongside him as well. A really good conversation and uh, really enjoyed sort of and his uh, take there from his son that he's never seen in his life a uh, game that uh, will be as close as this one and uh, I mean Enda described it as the naivety of youth I think there's something in it um, we've all been watching football for a while and it's uh, really there's nothing between them so it's 8.32 delighted to uh, welcome you along to OTB AM lots of comments coming in by the way um, on the football and everything else as well you are watching OTB AM brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with the new and improved razors uh, some of those comments uh, will and good morning to you, saying that uh, how much are Tyrone hated every time Dublin, who everyone hates, have played them. My mates from other counties up the north have been up for Dublin. That's how much Ulster counties hate Tyrone. It's not the Vax, it's the years of dirty play, underhandedness, arrogance, despite getting hammered over the last decade, etc. A lot of that might not be applicable to the Dewar team, um, but it is what it is. Any tickets, uh, wonders Kieran? We're all asking the same question this morning, Kieran. 24 hours out. Maybe a good time of the week to get them. I'm still uh, holding out hope for that. And uh, Kevin says the curse of Mayo means that Tyrone will have victory. Yeah. So, look, we'll see. All the standing by. We're going to let you know what's happening on the, uh, the back pages, including otbsports.com uh, this morning. Tyrone will look to swallow up Mayo in our Ireland final, says Conor McManus. That was uh, the Monaghan forward in conversation with the lads during the week. Um, 
Uh, brilliant story in the tennis. Uh, first time ever that a qualifier has made the uh, uh, final, a major final there uh, with the British tennis player Redicanu. So history, and she's up against another teenager in the final as well. So it's brilliant stuff, really. Uh, Irish golfers hoping to raise awareness of Parkinson's disease. That's uh, one of the golf pieces up there. And the FAI should uh, wait until the end of the qualifier campaign to assess Kenny's position, says John Giles with a very measured take. Uh, on the show last night. Across the back pages today, there is some reaction to those Jonathan Hill comments. We'll start with the Herald here. FAI chief uh, Coy on Kenny's future is the take of Dan McDonald inside. Hill refuses to directly back the manager, but has no problem with talk of long-term plans. Ronaldo, I will smash it at Old Trafford and Mayo can break deadlock and bring Sam West, says Kieran Whelan inside. Uh, the star, Game Ron, uh, Cristiano desperate to start he's been telling uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer stick me in none of this bench stuff uh, FAI cam on Kenny's future is the way that uh, Paul Lennon uh, takes it there on Jonathan Hill's comments and Philly which is one we'll come back to Philly McMahon leaders didn't step up so um, strong stuff from Philly McMahon there on the reasons why Dublin came short against Mayo the Irish Times picture of Fergal Lone there and the, uh, Logan on the front there Logan eager for Tyrone to grasp their final opportunity writes Ian O'Riordan and lots more build up to the game there including the fans view Mayo journey's been a life giving and celebratory thing like I think that's just a load of old cuds wallop that ultimately uh, once they win it they all go yeah yeah like no it was totally about winning it the Irish Daily Mail no promises Kenny's future to be reviewed says FAI Chief Hill that's Philip Quinn inside sky high historic deal for uh, Ireland that's the women's national team and the picture of Rihanna Jarrett there juggling the ball uh, with the new sponsor blazing across the front. And Tokyo hero Keane, Ellen Keane, we deserve more respect. And very much the tone of the conversation she was having with Jer on OTB AM during the week. The Sun, Ronaldo, I'm going to be huge. Uh, all goats, but will there be glory? That's the preview of the Ireland final and uh, some other bits and bobs there as well inside the sun. One interesting one on the London Times this morning, UEFA chief and boycott threat to World Cup. It was only a matter of time, right, before this sort of this came out. We'll go into a bit more detail on that in a couple of moments' time as well. The Mur, time to sweat, boss. Uh, Kenny gets no assurances about contract as November D-Day looms. It's been interesting to see across the back page the exact same quotes, different spin, that's Paul Hare inside saying the FAI boss Jonathan Hill is not not uncomfortable. I mean, I presume that means he's comfortable with Stephen Kenny speaking publicly about Ireland's Euro 2024 push. So that's slightly counter to the headline there. Um, <clears throat> England claim Walker was racially abused during stormy Poland clash. That's in the Telegraph this morning. Kyle Walker alleging more... Uh, more allegations of racism there and it's a theme picked up on The Guardian as well Poland racism row denial issued after England claimed that uh, Glick abused Kyle Walker and Old Trafford gets the all clear after India Covid scare that's uh, the cricket which is getting pretty interesting uh, as well so a couple of those stories come back to the and Owen I think you're there you've, yeah. you've shifted location I have indeed. You've moved into the toilet. Good man. Right. The <laughs> story about Stephen Kenny and all the quotes that are across the back pages this morning. Um, and I know you're not seeing all of this, but just to give you a bit of a sense of what's going on here. So, the obviously, uh, Jonathan Hill was out yesterday in front of the media with the launch of the new women's national team sponsor. It was a really great story. It's in some ways unfortunate that, um, obviously, it was always going to come up with Stephen Kenny and that's grabbed a lot of the headlines today. But he's just saying that uh, the, the direct quote here from the man... Our normal approach to every international window is that we review that window at the end of our monthly board meeting. Uh, in this case, I believe it's uh, November, it is. He says, in a calm and collective way, uh, we will review the whole World Cup qualification campaign in the same way in November. And that's pretty much the essence of it. He goes into a bit more details about it. Um, it seems quite reasonable. It's an unenviable position, I think, for him to have been in because uh, he knows full well that he goes in front of the media yesterday this is obviously a justifiable legitimate talking point he's going to get asked about it no matter what he says people are looking for a crumb of oh my god he's just said that Stephen Kenny is uh, going to get sacked oh my god he just said Stephen Kenny is safe which means he's probably going to get sacked anyway so it's sort of um, a bit of a thankless task in that no matter what he says people are going to pick through it they're going to read as you can tell as I said from some of the headlines that have appeared across the back pages this morning that people are going to read their own thing into it so it's an unenviable task but um, I think he's made a lot of good steps here I think he's chosen the right words he hasn't stoked it up it's not any great guarantees 
and it's just stick to the process. We're going to review it in November. We'll be calm and collected about it. He says Stephen Kenny is going to have his own input into that. Um, you know, I think that if I'm Stephen Kenny reading those quotes this morning, I'm like, okay, cool, let's get on with business. Yeah, like I guess there's one way for this to all go away, and that's to give Stephen Kenny a new contract. If, if he gets a little bit sick of the questions, then uh, there's a pretty easy fix to it. But I think it's fair enough to play a wait and see game. I mean, we've seen quite divergent opinions on the Stephen Kenny reign so far. A lot of people want him out, a lot of people want him to get a new contract. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were people within the FAI and in the hierarchy who were still undecided about the next step. I guess it would be nice to have an idea on the 1st of January next year about what the future of the Irish manager is going to be. So this next window, these next run of fixtures are going to be really, really important to decide that. I think there's a, a really good feeling after the last night, to be honest. I think that it, it was finally a little bit of luck for this Republic of Ireland team. Maybe the rubber green over the next little while can, can paint a few better pictures when it comes to the final results. The qualification campaign is dead, but when it comes to the, to, to the results, he probably needs just a couple of those to ensure that he gets that new deal. But I don't think that he needs to, for example, beat Portugal at home. I don't, I don't think that's the magnitude of result that that's required. I do think that people like Jonathan Hill can see for themselves the performances on the pitch and they can see that results are coming and better results are surely on the way soon. Yeah, the Portugal chances probably pass us by, hasn't it? In that, like, that's the shock to the system that Portugal needed and now they're not going to take us granted anymore. So that ship has probably sailed. We'll see. But I think you're right when you talk about... Um, the easy thing to do is for the FAI to come out and go, right, we're giving them a new contract. But, like, the reality is, sure, they probably don't even know. Like, and they should be given the time and space themselves. Like, you know, in previous regimes, that's exactly what would have happened. They'd have come out and gone, well, we need to put this to bed. We're going to give them a new contract. Sign them up for the next 10 years. And in three months' time, they're saying, actually, this is a mistake. So let them see out the campaign and review it then because it's, uh, again, it's legitimate that they don't know themselves the answer to the question. So I think in that context, he's probably not foot, put a foot wrong, I think, in, in that way. Some of the other stuff I want to come to, Philly McMahon, um, back page of the Star this morning, Paul Kane. Um, he's been out and about a launch uh, this week, the Bulbs for Bees campaign, which was launched. Um, and he was obviously asked about the um, defeat. And he said it was one of those things um, that I felt when things aren't going as well as they should, you're waiting for the next man to step up, for a leader to step up. And we probably didn't have that. Like, they are really... Those quotes are going to come up again and again and again because that's not... What he's saying there is not... Ah, things didn't go exactly our way in the day. Little slice of luck that way. Maybe we would have got over the line. Or, you know, a bit of transition and those players get a little bit of... A uh, bit more uh, cockpit hours and, and they'll be flying along. He's actually saying... And you look at some of the... Um, established players that are in that Dublin team. I'm sure, again, are reading those quotes this morning saying that's a direct cut at me. I, they're fascinating. It's a fascinating insight into um, what what's going on in Dublin's minds post that game. Now, I mean, I don't know. He obviously maybe didn't, you know, don't step in front of Robbie Henley and uh, everything will be grand, Philly. That didn't seem to be, it didn't seem to be a huge factor in his considerations. But I think... Uh, certainly an interesting uh, insight into the whole thing and you know if Stephen Cluxton was around Owen it would have been all grand It's a criticism of a couple of the younger players I think isn't it uh, that they didn't step up and show the, the leadership qualities that were required this year when they have a billion different All-Ireland medals walking out of the camp over the last 18 months there was a vacuum of leadership in the, in the dressing room that was only going to be natural so I think that that's probably what he's getting at with those comments maybe that takes time and maybe Dublin need to have another look at how they managed to do, how they managed to create a leadership group in 2010, 2011, and can they do a similar thing with this young group of players? Yeah. Like, I, I'm not talking about ripping the whole thing up and starting again, but I wonder just on that level, is there are there conversations to be had? Yeah, I mean, also James McCarthy, Brian Fenton, Kieran Kilkenny, all senior established players. When he talks about the next man stepping up, like maybe that is what he's talking about. But also those players were on the pitch and have the capacity to, like Dean Rock, Conor Callaghan, almost at this point, you nearly consider him to be a senior player, like. Yeah, there's a lot of established senior players out there who I think, and look at, I'm sure they'll do the reviews and they'll come back and say, there was a lack of leadership, what are we going to do the next time that happens? And also, those young players that you're talking about, they obviously, that's something that doesn't come in the first two, three, four, five years of inter-county football. It's something that comes um, as their careers progress. So, But I'm sure I'm sure they'll address it. You can't, you, I, I think as well, you don't really know if you have it until you're in that sort of situation, like a lot of those Dublin players maybe 
weren't up against the pump a whole pile over the last few years and really that Mayo game when things were starting when the opportunity was starting to slip through their fingers and they realised that Mayo were making a real comeback that was a proper pressure cooker moment now it was a pressure cooker moment for Mayo as well and they had players that I think a lot of people would have said they're not going to be at the level when it comes to the mentality that Dublin have and that wasn't the case they all stepped up and they they really came through that game in, in spectacular fashion so there will probably be a game in the next couple of years where Dublin get that back again, it's, it's kind of hard to predict when these things happen. And they've done it once before. They've gone from the doldrums to a brilliant place. And you, you definitely suspect that they have the personnel. And the players, you mentioned they're the players. Like, they're all around next year. And mm. like, I mean, if they're, if they're not really driving this thing on next year and, and trying to show that the younger players need to step up, then, then something's really wrong. Yeah, in a like if I was Peter Keane managing Dublin on who, you know, just wants to get through games with a full squad of players uninjured, it's the most important thing, don't worry about winning. I'm uh, really positive as a as a Dublin fan right now because, you know, we're not having the conversation that had been had over the previous number of years where there's going to be a raft of retirees. It's not really... Uh, I mean, we don't know about Stephen Cluxon and actually I would have thought the bat signal maybe had gone up ahead of that Mayo game if there was a um, suspicion of a lack of leadership, like you're putting somebody straight back into the mix... And I know there yeah. are complications with it. But, yeah, there are reasons to be positive if you're a Dublin fan. I thought Comerford did well in that semi-final. Uh, I mean, like I mean I more from a leadership, you know, from that. Yeah, of like, course. No, of no course, criticism like, of him as a goalkeeper. Comerford will, will, will be brought forward um, from that moment as well. Mm. Like, I mean, it's a very, it's just a very needless dig at Peter Keane there, Adrian, I must say. Like, I'm just saying the, the, it's, it's... The uninjured the uninjured line was during the National League and who were who the joint National League champions? And look, one but trophy it, it, was, out of the it, it might have been on, but it was ludicrous. It was a ludicrous, you have to accept it was a ludicrous comment. Uh, well, I don't know. I think getting through the National League on skates is when it was so close to the championship was uh, a high priority. And they managed... But they also managed to win the competition that, well, half of it, themselves in Dublin, are the real winners half of this year's, uh, this year's <laughs> GA season. We half with it. There's never been anything more, Kerry. <laughs> They've half won it. I'm just saying that, like, it's not when they sit down with the... Co- I accept that it's obviously a part of the, re- of the... It's part of your priorities, but it's not the priority. To pr- and he literally said the priority was to come through without any injuries. It's no. I think that's I think that's fair. I think you can pick a lot of other stuff that he said that was nonsense, but like I think that was fair enough. It was the league and it was well, so well, if there's stuff shit. if the stuff that works that's worse than that, then I think what we're looking for here is a bit of ah, a, well, power, they, a power if, ranking. If, they, if there were if there weren't the goals, the game would have been fairly even, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. The uh the Times, the last story to touch on here from across the back pages this morning, UEFA Chief. Uh, the only surprising thing about this story is that it's taken so long to come to light. UEFA Chief uh, in boycott threat to the World Cup it's an exclusive for Martin Ziegler um, chief sports writer there who's out and about to get the quotes on this and to be fair it's a great interview to get so it's the UEFA president Alexander Seferin saying that the plan that's been mooted and spoken about and fairly surreptitiously planted in the you know if you look at Michael Owen's tweets you listen to Arsene Wenger everybody's sort of a little seeding it out there just and suddenly before you know it it's a thing but Alexander Safran is going to make sure that as far as any impact that he can have it's not going to be a thing to have a World Cup every two years he says it would kill football so he ain't on the fence about this um, and it now publicly pits the two powerhouses of world football on opposite sides of the fence he's saying that um, UEFA could and by all accounts would decide not to play it and interestingly after that does that you know, how does that impact if I'm England if I'm the FA Similarly, in France or Germany or Spain, and I'm like, I'm seeing the dollar signs. Um, how does all that play out? Do we end up with a bit of a European Super League situation, a bit of a breakaway threat? He says that South America are the exact same, and they'll uh, also boycott it. So yeah, does is it dead before it begins? Is that now the end of it? UEFA saying they're out, um, you know, or is it a bit of a play for a bit more? A nice check there for five million, or I don't know what the equivalent of this case would be, but I would think a some a multiple of that. Uh, really interesting to see how it plays out, but it is it's the biggest power play yet to counter these um, notions that have been put out there about a World Cup every two years. So that's what's going on with that this morning. Uh, and by the way, you are watching OTB AM. It's coming up on ten to nine this morning. Lots still to come. John Giles, uh, and we'll get into our quick picks in just a few minutes' time. We're going to preview the Camogie finals as well in the company of Sarah O'Donovan. But you're watching OTB AM, brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. And on, I think you have a couple of the local papers there to let us know what's happening ahead of tomorrow. Uh, we don't actually I don't have them uh, handy uh, I'll um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll grab them. It's fine. And, and have them don't, don't, we'll show. never, we will never come back to that. We'll never speak of it again. We'll never mention it again. And we will say that if anybody wants to get an insight as to what's happening with the newspapers, just go on. Well, we, we got the uh, Declan Bogue did bring exactly. us through some of the, the local papers there. So I thought, I thought he had it boxed off. He of Tyrone residency, of course. Why would you need someone like me to tell you what's going on in the Tyrone media when you've got? Uh, the, the greatest GEA journalist living in Tyrone uh, taking you through it. Exactly. Go and check out that, that full piece. Well worth it. And you get it right inside in the papers. And I should mention, by the way, there was the, the best counterpoint to the uh, there should be a World Cup every two years was the football writer Jack Pitbrook tweeting during the week, Christmas is really popular and is also good for the economy. So how about we change the Christmas calendar and introduce another Christmas on June 25th? It's uh, It really sums that. up the whole thing, doesn't it? You can get me I, out I another Christmas, Jesus own. I mean, and, and also, I mean, uh, the success of Christmas is in its uh, recurrence every year. A World Cup every year is what I say, not every second year. <laughs> You'd basically at that point have Christmas all year round, right? Like, you know, the uh, the pre-Christmas sales would be would be uh, never ending. Right. It is uh, 10 to 9. As I said, we're going to preview the Camogie finals in just a couple of minutes' time in the company of Sarah Donovan. We're going to talk to John Giles as well, and we're going to keep uh, bringing any more comments that you have about the football or anything else besides. Uh, do lash them into us, and we'll keep bringing you those uh, your way before now, uh, between now and 10 a.m. this morning. Right now, last time, barring a possible replay, it's time for the quick picks. So many critics, these pundits. I absolutely adore them, lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. OK, let us have a look at the scoreboard going into Oof. the final week, as you said, possibly the final week of the quick picks. Uh, it is who in the lead? It is going Tommy, to be Tommy 45. in the lead, I think, at the moment. Ah, uh, 45. Followed Adrian, by there Adrian 44, place. Will, 43, and then some other lad who ain't getting, who's going to stay there. He's on 39. Yeah, it's, it's me at the bottom of it. Uh, as we've already established, uh, we have absolutely no interest in the scoreboard. But Tommy, you confident of holding on to your, to your top spot? There is no prize for this, by the way, which just shows how meaningless this whole thing is. It's absolutely not meaningless. Any internal competition and off the ball is very much meaningful. Am I confident? Absolutely not. I have absolutely no confidence in calling this All-Ireland final one way or another. I actually, lads, have no idea how I'm top of the table. I can't remember top of my head how I got that many calls right. Well, I can Maybe tell I you, Tommy, started... if you want, if you want, I can give you the insight. What happened was midway through the tournament, I was in a runaway lead that was unassailable. And the rules were changed with a view to toppling me off the table because people felt, you know, there was an agenda out there. And that's exactly what happened. And you fluked your way up to the top. There you go, Adrian. An absolute fluke to get where I am. Yeah. So what what are what is your thought process then uh, coming up with your prediction for this week, Tommy? We may as well have a look at the predictions this week. It's Tommy going for Mayo by one. I'm going for the exact same thing. Adrian's going for Mayo by three, and Will is going for Tyrone by two. So, Tom, Tommy, you, you're first up there. Go, why Mayo by one? Can I change my pick now to Tyrone? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Can I go for a draw? No. You said I, no draws. I, I, yeah, oh, like, give this, him a this, draw. This, this, no, I'm only messing. I'm only messing. I'm sick of Mayo by one. Um, I think I think they're going to do it. I think Mayo are going to get the job done. I'm very surprised we're not split down the middle. I'm very surprised by that. I thought, I thought Adrian, when you're chasing, you would have gone for Tyrone. I'm glad now. I'm glad I didn't looking at that, to be honest. But, geez, Tommy, I don't know. I've, it's like, exactly like you said. I There isn't a game all year that I haven't, I've been more torn about. It's impossible to know. Like... Since Will predicted Wicklow to beat Wexford back in whatever it was, June, <laughs> I, the, 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 you know, there's never been anything more close between the teams. Uh, I look at I don't know. It's impossible. My, to be honest with you, I'll be absolutely honest. I sent this through to Joe yesterday when I was sending through my prediction. I'm going totally against what I actually think will happen. Yeah. I just, Do not say Tyrone by seven. I, I, that was a, you know, my weekly, that was my weekly gag. The, the, uh, I just, I actually do think, I actually do think Tyrone are going to win it. I can't bring myself to make the prediction. So that's why I'm going for Mayo and oh. keeping my fingers crossed. And I, also, I, as I said, I don't think there's that much in it anyway, so I'm happy to go against my head. Why can't you bring okay, yourself well, to back to Rome? Uh, well, I, my mother's from Mayo and I, if, you know, so the, it, it has to happen, Tommy. We've had long there's, years in our house where there's oh. been, where, you know, and this thing about, 
the um, who was it that Owen was talking to during the week and he was talking about the RF who we couldn't see was saying ah listen we've really it's all about the journey and it's nothing to do with the destination that stuff is going to get blown into a rocket with Elon Musk up to whatever planet he's trying to get on as soon as they win the thing and they're just going to go yeah no it was totally about winning so that's it I, I, I have no great sort of anti tyrone stuff I just desperately want Mayo to win it and I can't for that reason back again. If there's any Mayo people sitting at home here listening to this I'd imagine their stomachs are turning. There's no room for sentimentality in the quick picks never mind on a GA pitch. The way look the way the reason I'm going for Mayo is that I've seen Mayo in the flesh four times this year and I've seen them building something. I wasn't convinced that they go in and they'd beat Dublin but I thought they had a chance. Obviously missing Killian O'Connor is a massive massive blow but this is a Mayo team that, that have got to back to back all Ireland finals the with James Horan, who has an unbelievable amount of experience, one of the top managers in the game over the last decade. Brian Dewar and Fergal Logan are still learning on the job a wee bit in intercounty football. That Donegal game, if Michael Murphy didn't get sent off, could have gone both ways. It could have gone the other way very easily yeah. that day. And they've built from there. Monaghan should have caught them. Conor McManus yeah. and Jack McCarron kick wides. They wouldn't kick any other day of the week. They should have caught them that day. And Tyrone were perfectly set to beat Kerry. I was, I'm not going to say who they were, but I was getting texts from friends from Kerry in 24 hours before the game saying the ambush is coming. Kerry manifested that defeat, Kerry fans. But they were afraid Kerry, Kerry. that Tyrone would catch them and they were like, do you know what? Just in case we get caught here, we'll say the ambush is coming. But the ambush had been set all along. Tyrone were always set up to beat Kerry, perfectly set. I don't think the same game plan can work against Mayo. They're a completely different proposition. It's chaos versus chaos this weekend. And I think Mayo were a little bit more control of the chaos. But Tom, is everything, everything you were saying, they're not a reason to believe in Tyrone somewhat. Like this is something that's been coming into my head as I really doubt my prediction. And you talk about Tyrone just edging some of those games. Like they edged some of those games. Nobody knows which way this, go- this game is going tomorrow. So if somebody's going to win it, they're going to have to edge it. Tyrone have experienced doing it. And everything you say there about, you know, the, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas of all the other teams that could have beaten them this year. The mm. same kind of goes for Mayo. Like, I would say that Dublin were worse in their semi final than Kerry were against Tyrone. And, you know, if you want to go shoulda, coulda, woulda, Dublin should have been better. Dublin could have been better. Uh, Robbie Henley could have missed his free. He could not have got a, a second one. So, like, if you're going to use that for Tyrone, you've got to use it for, for Mayo as well. So, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm buying that as the reason. Why, why Mayo win. I, I think Mayo actually just have better depth and I think they have more grit in some of the, the younger players that they have. And I, I think that the, 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 the winning of the game against Dublin was such a massive so, such a massive thing on their shoulder that they just couldn't get over over the last couple of years. And regardless, as I said, that Dublin were poor on the night, I thought, I think still getting over that psychological mountain was a massive thing, uh, almost akin to, to winning an All-Ireland final. So... That that's what's been giving me belief in terms of tipping them, but it's it's very very hard. Like Will, you're the one man who actually has gone for Tyrone this week. Yeah, look, I think um, my belief comes from the fact that Tyrone have come through a series of very difficult games, which have been left in nail biting situations. The Donegal game, which Tommy was talking about, the Ulster final against Monaghan. Even when they drifted a little bit, they were able to find answers and actually hold on and be so controlled in possession in the closing stages to ensure that they finished out that game on the right side of the result. And then against Kerry, while everyone is focused on Kerry's failings within the semi-final, like Tyrone, again, their performance in extra time, a little bit a mirror almost of Mayo against Dublin in the other semi-final. I thought Tyrone were excellent the minute that David Clifford went off and that once Kerry lost that outlet, Tyrone were able to shut down the game very impressively indeed. And I actually disagree with some of your Mayo supporters who are saying it's about the journey, not the destination. This time around, it's definitely about the destination because there's not too many finals that Mayo have gone into over the last 20 years where genuinely it has felt as 50-50 as this week is. They were underdogs in pretty much all the finals that they played against Dublin. They were underdogs going into finals against Kerry. And this time round, there's an expectation on Mayo to end the 70-year hoodoo because they have taken Dublin out in the semi-final. And I just wonder psychologically what that's going to do for Mayo and the fact that Tyrone, because of the COVID-19 situation, this has worked out nicely with their preparation going into the game. They've had a nice little break period and now they're you know, pretty much up on the back of having beaten Kerry in the semi-final. I think the two teams are going into this slightly differently. 
and as a result, I think Tyrone are just going to edge them out. I think defence might win over forwards this weekend. And I was very taken by what Conor McMahon has said on off the ball last night. Like, I've been listening to so many previews and reading so many previews this week and, you know, all the different blogs about Killian O'Connor might be back in training. McLaughlin, they found some way of uh, making sure that he can get onto the pitch. Oshie Mullen is back. And I've actually enjoyed the build-up to this All-Ireland final a lot. But I think Conor McMahon has made a very good point, which is that Tyrone were more than happy to seed kickouts and to seed quite a bit of possession against Kerry to allow Kerry to come into their trap and then turn them over. If Mayo can find the answers and have great variety to their attack, and if they can cause turnovers themselves, Mayo probably edge this one. But if Tyrone put the game plan out like they did against Kerry, I give them every chance of winning. And this wasn't just some pick to go. I think that Tommy will go for Mayo, so I'll go for Tyrone. I genuinely think Tyrone are just going to uh, just about edge it. I was going to go for a draw, lads, but we kind of had this rule that we weren't doing draws and we well, picked whoever wins. So even if it goes to the There is a replay in this one. Yeah, there is I, a replay in this one. I assume what happens here, lads, if one of us was to, you know, whoever we pick, if Tyrone go on to win on penalties or Mayo go on to win on penalties and replay, it's still the winner that we picked as opposed to a draw. That's the reason I didn't go for a draw. Yeah. Oh, we'll be coming yeah, back to the quick fix if it's what, what happens if, what, so if so I've gone for three points to Mayo to, I wish I'd gone two Tommy's gone one if Mayo, if Mayo win by three or more I win is that right? Yeah. Is that all you care about? Yeah and by the way come here I would say right like just to take on Will's point there I think that there's a case to be made that Mayo have had a handy path to the final I know everybody's going to say, ah, sure, listen, they beat Dublin. But I mean, look what they had to come through in Connacht. Like, ultimately, a poor enough Galway side. Was it Sligo before that? Whoever else. And Dublin, that, like, were just not really at the races. Like, you know, Philly McMahon on this morning talking about the lack of leadership. And I think that the hindsight merchants after the final might be able to go, well, look at what Tyrone had to come through against. Like, Cavan, uh, Armagh, Donegal... And then, uh, and then, as Owen would say, the best team in the country at the minute. And like, like that game could have gone either way in a way that the uh, maybe might have been less so the case with the 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 double match. So yeah, I think that the hindsight merchants might be able to afterwards go and include myself in that. Say, well, look at you. Wasn't it obvious? Tyrone had a really tough path to the final, um, and were clearly in a better run of form than Mayo were, who ultimately had a handy-ish path to get there. I, yeah. I just think, yeah, yeah, I just think the Tyrone matchups were perfectly set for Kerry. They focused on Kerry's most important players and had the right kind of personnel to detail them. I'm not I'm not sure that they can match up against Mayo's important players. How are they going to stop? the same goal for Mayo, Tommy. That's what I mean. I, and, and I just think that form, it's hard to read into form going into this one a little bit because from the semi-finals, I know what you're saying about Dublin perhaps being undercooked, but Kerry played one way all game long. Kerry went for goal for that whole game and that is what let them down. Kerry should have won that game, but they played one way the whole way uh, the whole way along, and Tyrone were set up to stop that way, which was conceding goals after the mauling they had got in the league. And I just think it's a very, very different game 13 days later or 14 days later. Like the matchups are, are going to be fascinating. Like, yeah. does who takes Conor McKenna? Like, is Conor McKenna even that important? Who stops Paddy Durkin? Who's Conor Myler going to tag this week? There, there's no real Paddy Clifford for. For Mayo, he's not going to go on Ryan Donoghue, who's, who's really their playmaker because he's in close to the forward line. So I just think that Tyrone could match horses for courses against Kerry and they could nullify some of the Kerry threats. I'm not sure they can do it this week against Mayo. I think it's just going to be chaos. And I think Mayo will edge it. It is Adrian by three for Mayo, Tommy by one for Mayo, and I'm going for the same as Tommy. And then Will is going for Tyrone by two. That is this week's GEA Quick Picks. I absolutely adore them lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. Gone nine o'clock. It is a OTB AM and it's Friday morning and it's the eve of the Ireland final and the uh, Camogie final as well. Obviously on this weekend we're going to talk to a Sarah Donovan in just a couple of moments time about a, about all of that and uh, get her thoughts on it and give a bit of a preview. So again, if you have any questions or thoughts uh, for Sarah, do fire those into us. Uh, here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. A OTB Gold uh, Jack McCaffrey, fittingly, with the weekend that's in it from one o'clock today. Friday Night Racing, uh, Jared Johnny from three. League of Ireland legend, Mark Quigley. Uh, f- uh, some Pat Stryker, Team thir- 33's subject today. And Chris Waddle in the hot seat for our uh, evening OTB Gold from six this evening. And, by the way, a reminder that uh, an NFL is back 
Uh, the Buccaneers edged out the Dallas Cowboys overnight in the opening game of the season. The Snap, OTB's American Football Show, is back as well. Uh, back this week, the Snap on OTB brought to you in association with the Aer Lingus College Football Classic, Northwestern against Nebraska at the Aviva Stadium on Saturday, August 27th, 2022. Going to be an absolute belter. Great atmosphere and great buzz about the town as well. Check out their brand new website, by the way, collegefootballireland.com for more details on all of that. Uh, and keep an eye out for a preview of that show during the week as Keen Fahey will give his thoughts on Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. It's All Ireland final week. Anything to say, boys? No, it's great to be here. It's great. How would you stop? <laughs> He's just spent 10 minutes of pre recording singing the Green and Red of Mayo and the N70, you name it. I'll tell you, I've never seen a man as excited in my life. Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. John is always running. It's a long drive to Croker from here. In ways even longer for the fans. The effort, I can tell you, it's worth it. Even today, I can still hear it. The roar of the hill. It's going to be something else. Yeah, I think Brady would be close to retirement age if he was a guard at this stage. <laughs> um, uh, the, it's the, the value in that team, and you mentioned it there, they retained all their pieces. The value in that team is that they're so well-rounded. Like the, Tom Brady's always going to uh, drag the attention away from everyone else. But if you look at last season, like he was the big name, the big off-season addition. He didn't really offer a huge upgrade from what was there offensively. It's that he picked the right team. He went to a team where he had a bunch of weapons. He went to a team where they had a defense that was just em- emerging and becoming this high-quality defense. And we saw what Jack Barrett and the rest of the defensive line did last year. They're still a terrifying team. And like tonight is the opening, ga- opening game of the season. And if you look at the Cowboys, you look at the Buccaneers, like Prescott is arguably well, a fully healthy Prescott. He's probably not fully healthy right now. But at this stage of his career, he's arguably a better player individually than Tom Brady is. But because the offense there is, well, actually, to be honest, if you talk about the offense, the offenses are quite similar. But once you jump to the defensive side, there's just a massive difference between that Buccaneers pass rush, between those linebackers who can cover every inch of the field, and the secondary being just good enough to complement the pass rush and the linebackers. And that's going to be a completely difference in this game because the Cowboys defensively are a mess. So that's going to be the way they go through this season, where if they can't beat you in one way, they'll beat you in another way. Because Brady will have his good games, he'll have his more average games because of his age. Even in the playoffs last year, he struggled quite a bit at times. But the team is good enough around him to offset that. So when Brady has good games and when Gronk is on the way he was in the Super Bowl, they'll blow teams out. So they're extremely talented. They've still got, like, and OJ Howard is coming back after getting injured last year. So they've got so much talent there. They've got so many opportunities to get better. And just even though they were the Super Bowl winners last year, and even though I kind of started this saying the Chiefs would have won if Mahomes was healthy, that's kind of always going to be the way just because of how good Mahomes is and how good that Chiefs team is. So they are going to need a little bit of luck. But they're right there in that mix at the very top again. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, it's uh, almost seven minutes past nine and it is uh, the weekend of the Ireland Camogie Finals uh, Sunday. Croke Park is the venue to be. Delighted to say that we're joined on the line by Sarah Donovan to look ahead to the morning to you, Sarah. Good morning, how are you? Good. I, I was, it feels like only, and it was not that long ago, only a few months that we were um, sat here chatting about split seasons and uh, club versus county and uh, uh, football versus camogie and all sorts of uh, story sponsorship is- issues and all that sort of stuff. The year started out so badly, Sarah. Feels to have been over the last while, and look, what we'll see in terms of attendances now on Sunday, but it feels like over the last little while the semi finals were good. The narrative around Camogie is in a better place now. They've gotten their act together. Look, it's not ideal that there isn't a sponsor for Sunday, but the Camogie Association had banked nearly two million last year because of COVID. So they're in a comfortable place to run the season without a sponsor, but they'll need a sponsor for next season. So I suppose Sunday is their showpiece event. They'll have to show everything and get people interested again, you know, for next year and, and for building for the future. Yeah, the football is obviously leading the way in terms of attendances and and, uh, and interest and that kind of thing. What's your expectation of how many will get on uh, on Sunday? Look, Cork haven't been there since 2018. Um, 
it feels to me like it's Paddy Murray's last hurrah. I think there's lots of things about Cork that are very positive. Uh, great support for the Cork girls from West Cork, from East Cork, from the city. I'd hope there'd be big numbers travel for Cork on Sunday because Cork is a very passionate Camogie County. So the only way they can show that support is by turning up. Yeah, you got to see them up close in July. If you're giving some advice to Galway this weekend, what is it? They're going to have to go high. So, you know, Hannah Looney loves to run the ball. You can't allow her to run the ball because they create an overlap and all of a sudden it's in Amy O'Connor's hand. So I think Galway are going to have to press them really high to stop them from playing the ball through the lines. Yeah. Um, the, the the suspensions the, for both sides or lack of has been sort of one of the talking points obviously in the lead into it um, Orla Cronin very experienced player obviously three game suspension sent off against Kenny in the semis potentially she'll get back into it I think there's an appeal uh, tonight if I'm right to the uh, hearings uh, post the hearings committee um, so who knows maybe she comes back into it but Linda Collins uh, the replacement if she's out unbelievable composure created a little bit of space at the end of the last game are they are they lacking much if that plays out the way it currently sits? Well, Linda's actually been named now, regardless of Orla. So Paddy's named fourteen players uh, for his team on Sunday. So if Orla's suspension doesn't okay. come, or, yeah. So if, if she isn't included, then there'll be somebody else parachuted in uh, at very late notice. Okay. Obviously, that player knows at this point, I imagine, but. Linda's kind of put up her hand now with that score. Um, I think she was very composed both before and after the game in the semi final. You know, it was a massive ask for her to come in and win the game for Cork as captain, being so disappointed, being left on the bench for her teammate from Corsi's. So she's answered a lot of questions. I do feel, though, that without Orla, Cork could be under a bit of pressure. I've, I've mentioned during the week that Orla is great to transition the ball. So Orla will go back really deep, 45 to her own 45 and carry the ball up through the lines and Cork don't have a player as comfortable on the ball as Orla to do that role in such a short space of time. Yeah, and like captain because like you said they, they, they have that system where you win the county and uh, so you get to nominate a player and that's why she comes in and to be fair it started most of the games I think up to the semi-final and then comes in and like the mentality and the maturity at I think only 24 but probably still maybe one of the senior players to to step up and put all that disappointment to one side and, and show that leadership which is a real quality again that you're looking for on big days like Sunday. I was surprised she had been left out to be honest because in the game that we played against them Linda has a great talent of bringing players into the game. So she plays in these little small pockets and then it's a little pass here, a little jink there. And she gets Katrina Mackey into the game, Orla Cronin into the game, Amy O'Connor into the game. Players like that are so, so versatile, but so, so crucial to teams. So hopefully this will be la this, that event will be Linda's last day on the bench. What, um, like Cork seemed to have, looking at the profile of the team generally, looked to have struck that balance between like some of the younger players coming in and obviously some of the more experienced heads that are still there as well. Um, and as you say, back in the final for the first time in a few years. Should the rest be, be worried uh, in some ways, Sarah, just that, that that's coming right now in a period that, like when you look at the profile of the team, in some ways looks like it's almost a transi transition period, but still reaching the final. Yeah, I, I suppose the problem is that Hannah Looney's already expressed her intention to leave after this season. Um, I don't know what Ashley Thompson's thoughts will mm. be. You know, they've been around a long time, even though they're very young. But I suppose from Cork's angle, they were in a minor All-Ireland final, which they lost to Kilkenny last week. They won the under-16 a month ago. There are players coming through, but the likes of Hannah probably needs to stay around for a couple of years. Pamela Mackey, Katrina Mackey, just to get those players through. We're asking an awful lot of them to give 10 years to Cork, but... I suppose Sunday will tell a lot because they need to win on Sunday. They, they've they been away from the top table for too long. Yeah. What do you do with Chloe Sigerson? <laughs> if I was Galway, oh geez, I think she's unmarkable. And anywhere on the pitch, she'll open up the shoulders and, and it's a guaranteed score. You have to stop her from getting ball in hand, you know? So that's a pretty miserable job from one of the Galway players. But there are the players there to do that. And I suppose Galway's defence is probably very settled. Um, what I'd be concerned about from a Cork point of view is that Galway's bench ha has a lot of weight. So Rebecca Henley can come in, Neil McGrath can come in, Tara Kenny can come in. Galway are missing Heather Cooney through a cruciate injury, but, you know, like Siobhan Gardner, Emma Hellebert, and then of course, Captain Fantastic Sarah Durvin going for her fourth um, year as captain. She is a, a, a mountain inside there, you know, she's a rock, you know, mm. I, I, she's the equivalent of the rock and Cork are going to be under a lot of pressure on Sunday to retain possession and get scores. 
Yeah, and uh, and from the Galway point of view, Paulie Murray had checked that same thing that you were mentioning in terms of the the depth that's there, and like you know maybe if it's tight late in the game, then that's something that that comes into play a bit, and that may be where they have the upper hand a little bit. I I think that's where they have the upper hand. Neve McGrath is basically a direct replacement for Neve Kilkenny. Neve has umpteen All Ireland's, um, an incredible camogie player is working in Dublin with William Fry and I, I, I imagine that's probably why she, you know, is, is out of the, the starting 15 right now. But for her to be able to parachute in for Neve Kilkenny if something was to go wrong, Cork don't have that same experience on the bench. Yeah. And what are you what are you thinking in terms of how it plays out there in terms of like the expanses of Crow Park, which teams uh, which team that suits better or or in terms of key matchups, what are you thinking? Uh, looking at the brass facts on the match the last day I thought Cork and Kilkenny was a much better game. Um, I thought Cork's striking was much better, so they were spraying ball much, much better. But I suppose I'd just be conscious that Galway were there in December. They were at the All-Ireland final, obviously lost Kilkenny. They were there again at the end of May, start of June in the league final. They've been in Croke Park a number of times and haven't left themselves down. I thought the last day against Tipperary, the Galway inside line was quiet. Orla McGrath, Siobhan McGrath, Ailish O'Reilly. They'll have watched that match back. They'll be disappointed they're going to come out all guns blazing. And I suppose you'd rather that they had a brilliant game in the semi-final, shot the lights out, and then came into the final nearly over-pressured. Whereas now I think they have something to prove. Yeah. I mean, I, w- I wasn't sure if if Kilkenny had come through on the other side. Is that a better thing for thing for Gal in terms of like the disappointment of last year and trying to put that to bed? I mean, I'm sure they love themselves well, psyched for Cork either way. Yeah, look, there's a healthy rivalry between the three top teams. There's a point in it every year. Like I suppose Cork will feel that refereeing decisions went against them against Galway in the last couple of games. Um, they'll be, I suppose, anxious for a fair day. Um, and Galway, by comparison, beat Kilkenny uh, three weeks ago by a point in the, in the group stages. So I suppose they'll feel they've put that one to bed and now it's Cork and now it's a clear run to, to the Hogan stand. And what's going to happen? My head says that there's a lot of momentum with Cork for this one, so I think Cork are going to win by two. Wow, right. Tight game. Uh, we take it. What about the, the intermediate final? Is the curtain raiser to that Antrim Kilkenny? Yeah, so Kilkenny and Antrim. Uh, Kil- Antrim were in the All-Ireland final last year in December against Down. I was up at it in Breffney Park. Uh, Kilkenny are, I suppose, an unknown entity. The last time they won the All-Ireland was 2016, and... Leanne Fenley's back centre back for them. She was in Australia for six years. So you've got some great stories around the Kilkenny team. But Maeve Kelly from Antrim is an outstanding camogie player. And I think Antrim will feel, having lost the Northern Derby last year, they're coming back to Croke Park this time to prove something. So my money's on Antrim. All right. Well, look, it's going to be a brilliant day at uh, Croke Park on Sunday. We hope the crowds come out and the weather stays good and the games are good as well. Sir, well previewed. Thanks a million. No worries. Thanks. Thanks. Sarah Donovan on the line there looking ahead to the Camogie finals this weekend uh, it is uh, 16 minutes past nine it's Friday morning and we still have John Giles to come for you by the way and some more as well from OMA ahead of uh, tomorrow's All Ireland Football Final 2 and uh, if you've been paying attention at all over the last while well, Jonathan Hill uh, and his Stephen Kenny quotes in the back pages uh, this morning the um, FAI chief exec but the Irish women's national team of course was the first ever exclusive primary sponsor being availed and another massive story that emerged in the last 24 hours and they've announced a landmark deal with Sky and it really is good news all around you'd have to say. Vera Powell, the manager was in hand at the launch, she spoke to her own Stephen Doyle about the FAI's recent announcement to give equal pay to both senior national sides. That equal pay deal of course that you refer to was cut between well the involvement of the two captains Seamus Coleman and Katie McCabe. Can you, do you know how this whole move was initiated. Was there an approach by the men's team to the women's team or vice versa? How did it come about? Um, It's been an ongoing uh, discussion eh, already for years. And we came from very, very far from this issue of changing the tracksuits. Yeah, it goes back to Emma Byrne and and the other players having the protest. Yeah, although that has happened in any country, I've done it also. Um, And um, I probably need to change now in the toilet also. (laughs) Uh, But... It stood for a place of women in football. That was it more. It was not the changing of the tracksuits. The girls also say that, the players. It's not the change of the tracksuits. It's what it stands for. And if I look now, from the moment I came in, I've never felt that anyone wanted to treat us differently than others. But we only cost money. But the fact, the way that we were dealing with it, 
and that we were realistic and that we were not demanding in the world things that, that we couldn't because we knew when the time is right, it will come because we felt equal approach. Um, and now the time suddenly was there. It just came out of the, uh, the almost out of the sky, it dropped out of the sky, if I can make that, that sentence. Um, I think the, 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 it, the initiative was, of course, the ongoing discussions, but the initiative was from uh, the men's team, especially the captain of the, of the men's team. Seamus Coleman. Yeah, who said, um, we need to do something now, mm. because by doing that, we support this fight for, for the women. And we know that, it, that we have the, the key in our hands for that deal. Um, so they've, they've been, from that very first moment, they've been the key partner into this negotiation. We're very grateful, um, but especially very proud of the men of our country. The male players, you know, whatever about the international payment they get, but the salaries they get there from their clubs, it means they don't have to worry about finances when they come and play for their country. The women's team aren't the same, but now they have this equal pay. Do you think that will help performances on the pitch? Of course, they have time to rest now. Um, if I take uh, Chloe Mustaki as an example, she ruptured her ACL because she was leaving the house at 6.30 in the morning, coming back in the house after training in 12, 12 o'clock, 11.30, 12 o'clock at night, and the next day had to leave the house at 6.30 again. So there comes a moment that fatigue is coming in, in a way that you hardly can av avoid uh, injuries, constantly being overloaded, not having the time to rest, but yet having to train because she had a, had a kind of professional contract in England. Um, but players like her will now be able to work less, so that to have the time to eat, to have the time to rest, next to their training, because the training intensity is high, but now they have the time to actually get the training into quality of, of what they play. Women's national team manager Vera Power in conversation with Stephen Doyle at the launch of the uh, Sky sponsorship yesterday. A really important point there, but it's not about the tracksuits. It was the broader point about uh, equal pay in terms of conditions. And uh, Seamus Coleman stood up as well. You have to take your hat off there and say fair play to him for helping to force all of that through. So, um, yeah, Golf Weekly and a, its uh, latest episode is live. It was a Solheim Cup beyond her wildest dream, of course, for Leona Maguire as she went from a rookie to a legend early on in the week, uh, the lads at Golf Weekly say it was inevitable. She is a rookie, but she's experienced. And the arc of progress has been steadily pointing only in one direction for the last three years, and that's upward. So, you know, she's a record breaker at the Solheim Cup. She's also a record breaker in the last round of the Evian Championship. She, saw, she shot the lowest round in a major ever in the men or women's game with a 61, ever. And I, I saw somewhere it was like they calculated that's roughly fifty thousand rounds of golf, and wow. you know cumulatively, yeah. Um, the I so she's two-time Olympian. She has been progressing always, and I, I saw a quote from Dan Brooks, who was her coach at Duke, and he said, "This isn't surprising at all." Uh, what you have to understand is that there's a level of work there. There's a level of toughness, both physically and mentally. It's incredible. She's tougher than anybody else. And that translates to being really good in match play. And this is the, and the ultimate compliment. She locks in like Jack Nicholas. And just, and I didn't know this about Dan Brooks, but this is a guy who's won seven national titles in 37 years as a head coach. So he knows a thing or two about coaching young talent. And for him to kind of highlight that Leona Maguire has a toughness reminiscent of Jack Nicholas or perhaps Tiger Woods is the ultimate compliment. And certainly this isn't flash in the pan stuff. I mean, she mightn't have next year. She mightn't have the astonishing moments she's had this last week, but it leaves you in no doubt that this is a player that's going to feature for a long time to come at the very top of the LPGA tour. 
Very hard to uh, replicate what, as Fiona rightly says, what she's done over the last uh, few weeks. And as you can see there, the uh, Golf Weekly this week uh, brought to you in association with Sky Sports exclusively uh, the players to watch the Ryder Cup as well upcoming. So uh, do stay tuned uh, to the lads for more of that and have a great prize as well to give away this week. So uh, how do I get my hands on all of that? You're wondering to yourself. Well, uh, you want to hear the full show or the rest of all that great stuff that the lads have over on Patreon. You can head to otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly or indeed just head over to Patreon directly and type in golf weekly and it'll bring you directly there and you can sign up for the uh, sum of three ninety nine a month plus fat and you'll get access to that and any exclusive events we have around the majors as well uh, and including around the Ryder Cup and uh, also to our Discord channel which uh, daily is alight with the finest of golf chat and opinion and analysis and reaction and all of that good stuff so it all lives over there I should note as well by the way some breaking news from the world of cricket this morning that the fifth test uh, India against England at Old Trafford has been cancelled a number of the tourist backroom staff have tested positive for COVID-19 so they were unable to field the team they fear further cases spreading through their squad so that is it for now that's been um, cancelled so it is 9.24 it's Friday morning you're watching OTP AM uh, John Giles still to come before we leave you at 10 o'clock in conversation with Nathan from the show last night uh, but it's uh, to further build up to the match at the weekend and we've been painting the greater cultural context uh, with Owen who's up in Tyrone and earlier caught up with uh, Enda McGinley and Declan Bogue as well and talking about how the county splits uh, and it's always a common theme when it comes to any of the Ulster teams playing in the Ulster final uh, and here on that tone is another piece for you in February 1988 Aidan McInespy was killed at a checkpoint in Octacloy in County Tyrone moments after crossing the border on his way to play for Agaloo in a GEA match and outside the Agaloo club today there's a monument dedicated to Aidan McInespy and Aidan's friend Mickey Muldoon met on there yesterday To me personally Aidan was a, a, a very close friend of myself I knew Aidan throughout the years and uh, the McInespy family, a very close family and uh, we we'll, we'll all recognise, we thought it was only appropriate that there was something erected for Aidan's, Aidan's memory that, that throughout the whole of Ireland and the world at this stage recognise Aidan and uh, clubs, clubs throughout, throughout Ireland all recognise Aidan's monument and as you see it's decorated here for the whole Ireland, which every every year is, is decorated, no matter who's in it. Uh, we had Limerick and Cork just passed there in the Horn. So there's, we make no difference to anybody. We have Donegal, we have uh, Kerry, Tipperary. We have flags sent from all different counties, and they all appreciate the, and uh, acknowledge the the fact that Aidan's monument, that their counties is recognised, and their clubs also, with county clubs, especially our local, local clubs here, that might be in county finals, they're all recognised also. I think everybody knows Aidan's, Aidan's story by now, and what really did happen, like, you know, it, we know we're not going to hear the truth from the British side of it, but I think that the Irish people and people throughout the world know and are well used to the lies that have been told. What we, what we see about Aidan's name being kept alive, it's not only Aidan alone, but we also had two other members of this club, uh, more than also, and there's a, a lot of clubs throughout the north especially had been killed and murdered by uh, security forces or loyalist forces. And it's, it's also to recognise for justice, Aidan's case, trying to get justice for Aidan's case, it's also trying to get justice for, for everybody else eh, in similar circumstances. And, I mean, nobody ever wants to see this back again, and we don't think it, it will come back, you know, troubles. So people want to move forward. And I say now the club here itself is a great club going now. And just yesterday evening, we're out here yesterday evening, they decorating here. And the amount of young people that's out here playing football, uh, children and from 
from knee high, from, I'd say eight year old, it, it's, it's so unbelievable. I mean, we hadn't got that in our time. In 1986, uh, Tyrone were playing Kerry in the, in the All Ireland, and uh, me and Aidan, God rest Aidan, we went to Crook Park, and uh, this is the caps uh, that we had worn in, in 86 to the All Ireland. And uh, whenever we came home, we had got beat, as everybody knows, Kerry, we're up to half time. We are well ahead, but the uh, second half, Kerry stuffed us. I suppose Pat Spillane, probably himself, nearly stuffed us. But uh, anyhow, on the return journey home here, the checkpoint was just down the road where Aidan was moored from. And uh, on, on arriving at the checkpoint, there was a, an, an old shade. Now, it was, it was old checkpoint at the time before they built the, the, the large one. Uh, Aidan was told to pull into the shade, which we did, and the soldiers proceeded to, to search the vehicle and the usual old harassment and crap that was going on. And I took, I had the Tyrone flag with me, and I, I took the, the, the Tyrone flag out and I stuck it up on the side of the shade. And the soldier says, says, what are you at, mate? What, what are you at? He says, didn't carry kick your asses? Didn't carry kick your asses? Now, and they were even effing and blinding. It wasn't just as nice as didn't they kick your asses, but anyhow, basically, I says, yeah, so we did. And he, say, he says, well, why, why are you putting that up, mate? What, what's that all about? And I says, look, I says, Tyrone will be back. I says, we'll be back. And the soldier didn't know what to make of this. And we... My words come through, we did come back and we won three all Ireland since that and now we're back in another one and hopefully we'll have a fourth one. A lot of people leave we think that's, that's like an angel, an angel's of, uh, but that we have had things from all counties left here, like we, we memorials, we things, uh, there was no time ago there was a, there was a Limerick hall, we hall, uh, but they do get lost, unfortunately, but people leave the wee tributes and, and things to their counties and clubs, and which uh, the McInestries do appreciate, and at times uh, it, I would give some of them over to the McInestries, or they may collect them themselves, of course. Uh, they do get lost, unfortunately, at times. So it's wee things like that, it seems to mean a lot to, to the McInestries too. We have... <laughs> We have all nationalities uh, now playing uh, across the divide, religious divide. It makes no difference. They're all accepted to play for, for the clubs, and that's the way we want it going forward. And that's, I think that's the way, eventually, to unite everybody. Wise words there from Mickey Muldoon in conversation with Owen yesterday following the... Um, a, a murder of his friend Aid McInnesby and uh, it should be pointed out as well that a uh, former soldier um, he will stand trial for it it looks as though this month uh, at Belfast Belfast Crown Court um, the unlawful killing of Aid McInnesby February 21st 1988 and uh, the former um, Grenadier was talking about how it uh, was an accident at the time and uh, as I said that case will come before the court you can check out all of Owen's chats he's been doing a lot of build up to the game culturally and on the football side as well they'll all be available up on our YouTube channel uh, over the course of today so um, very much recommend that you head along and check those out as well by the way as all the build up uh, and coverage of the game over the weekend on Off the Ball Saturday 1 o'clock on your radios and across your social channels as well All Ireland Preview Panel all in association with Renault it'll be Peter Canavan David Brady and Alan Brogan there uh, also Lee McHale is going to be in Croke Park my god what is going to happen to Lee McHale if they uh, end up winning that game Mayo uh, Mossy Quinn is going to watch the game in the studio so all the full analysis from the two lads over the course of the day Football Saturday as well we'll talk about the women's kit sponsor Ronaldo debut obviously as well Karen Duggan uh, the former Ireland international in the company of Dan McDonnell uh, and then over on Sunday that's all with John by the way on Sunday then Will is in the hot seat 
Uh, one o'clock as well, Austin O'Malley, John O'Mahony and Enda McGinley will all review the All-Ireland Football Final. The paper review, Johnny Ward and Timmy McCarthy and Sarah Dunham, who we've been chatting to a bit earlier on, will be at Croke Park for those Camogie Finals. Uh, Cork v Galway in the big one and live Premier League commentary. Leeds United against Liverpool from half past four and that'll be Vinnie Perth in the company of Stephen Doyle. So that's what's uh, coming up on News Talk over the weekend as well. A reminder also that you can subscribe to the OTB AM podcast. You can get uh, that on the OTB Sports app. Search OTB AM wherever it is that you get your pods. Join the 120,000 plus who subscribe to the OTB YouTube channel so far to get all of our best stuff uh, ready whenever and wherever it is that you are. We're going to leave you this morning and a very good morning to you and enjoy the weekend sport, whatever it is you're watching. Thanks many for uh, checking us out during the week. We'll talk to you with all the very best, by the way, of reviews from Croke Park both Saturday and Sunday and Monday morning from half past seven. But we're going to leave you this morning. John Giles talking to Nathan last night. So uh, this time last week, we were probably all a little bit high after going so close to beating Portugal in the World Cup qualifiers. Since then, there has been a... 1-1 draw with Azerbaijan, a hugely disappointing result, but probably a game Ireland should have won. And 1-1 draw against Serbia, where there was a big grandstand finale, but probably a game Ireland should have been beaten in. What do you take from the last week? Um, <clears throat> well, certainly the last, the last match we played um, was probably the best you could look back on as, as a result. Mm. I'd say the Portuguese match, um, there was more to... Uh, look forward to from uh, and and from the game itself. We, we I think we certainly played better in Portugal than we did in the next two matches. So how did Ireland go from playing so well last Wednesday night against Portugal and coming so close to gaining a massive result against such a quality side to not being able to break down an Azerbaijan team four days later? Um, well that's that's the sixty-four million dollar question. That's why we pay you the big bucks, John. <laughs> um, well, it, it, first of all, it's very difficult to know. Uh, but, well, a couple of things that I can I can say that in uh, the Portuguese match, I thought our two best players were uh, Coleman mm. and Doherty, and, but- and then when it came to the next match against. Uh, as of by Jan, uh, neither of the two players played in the same positions. Coleman went to middle of back in, in the back three, and Doherty went on the right hand side. Um, and I think also in the second match there was a, the, the 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 forward line was changed in a big way, uh, where I didn't think there was any balance to it. Um, with um, uh, Ida. Connolly and Paris. Paris, you know, like mm. the, the, where Paris, like, I know where Ida was playing because he's a big centre forward. He plays up front, but when you when you try to fit two other attackers in, without I think two is ideal and one one wide, uh, Nathan. But when you get three, th- there is no position really for two players either side of Ida. You no think balance. one no player should be able to, to do the job? No, it's it, it just. It's a no, it's a no position if I'm if I'm saying it in the right way. Yeah. Uh, because you need two up front. That's fine. But the, the other one playing off either. But when you have three up there, I mean, the, there's nowhere for them to go, and and therefore you've nobody wide when you've got three up there like that. So that was a big change from the first match. Now I can understand Stephen because he wants to see all the players, but I think it has to be a balance to what you're doing, and certainly like when I, I found as manager, you go from one match to the next. And against Portugal, again, I'll repeat myself, like Coleman and, and Dennis, they're, they're really good. Mm. So, and, and the goalkeeper, of course, was, was excellent from the start. Uh, and, and, and as a manager, uh, in my opinion, you look at the positives. You say, right, they're good. That's good. That's good. We'll keep with that. But we didn't. We went, we, we went, Coleman went to the back. I know there was an injury, uh, but, but, but I, don't, I think if the players play well. Yeah, right, I stick with him. He's a good player. He's the, and th- there were there were big changes for the second match, uh, Nathan. The performance of Coleman and Doherty against Portugal was such a positive, and it gave Ireland. Uh, they were almost able to control the game as much as Ireland had any control in the game. It seemed to come from when it came to Doherty and Coleman and that they held on to the ball when they needed to. They were able to play balls down the line and release the forwards. And we probably saw the first time the two of them have really played well at the same night for Ireland. Is that something then as a manager you go, okay, yes, Darrow Shea is injured. 
I bring in Oma Bamadele because then I only have to make one change or yeah. actually replacing Oma Bamadele, they end up having to make two or three changes. Well, 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 well what he did was that he, he, he removed Coleman from the position he played well, well in and mm. Doherty in the position. So you, you leave them and you put somebody else, as you say, in the, in the, in the back, back three because you stick with what's good. The goalkeeper was great. The two fullbacks were great. Got that. Now, now we go from there. That's what those matches are for. Who can we put in there that, that's going to make it, uh, you know, that suits the team? And, and instead, those two lads didn't play. And then we had the three up front where there was no balance to. So that was a big change as well. Now, I know all managers, and as Stephen said, have to make changes. But you, you don't have to, if, if you get a positive, in my opinion, you stay with the positive, And then you look for more positives in the team as you go along. Mm. With the players that Ireland have right now and the players that started against Azerbaijan should they be good enough to beat Azerbaijan? Definitely definitely we, we have to have players uh, in the squad that we have uh, to beat Azerbaijan definitely definitely I mean if you look at the, if you look at the two teams playing over a period of time how many of the Azerbaijan team would get in the Irish team mm. or in the, in the squad maybe one or two I'm not sure but I mean you, have, you only have to look at the records I mean, uh, Azerbaijan's record is, is very poor because it, 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 that's, that's the type of team they are. So I know, I know Stephen is, is, is in the early stages, well, fairly early stages, uh, and you wouldn't expect us to beat Portugal with the players that they have, but we would be expected to beat Luxembourg and Azerbaijan uh, in, in these particular matches, Nathan, definitely. And I know it's hard to tell from the outside, but the fact that Ireland didn't then, and you talk about those tactical changes, is it down to those changes? Did you see a lack of confidence? Because, you know, it's one win in 16 games now. These are young players who've dreamed all their life of playing for Ireland. They didn't imagine it would be like this. Do you look at that team and see they just need a bit of a lift? They need a spark from somewhere and they're not getting it at the moment? Um, well, well, as manager, you, 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 you're always looking for that, Nathan. But you have to look, like every game, you, you, you see something new in it. You know, mm. either good or bad. That, that's how you, that's how you progress. You know, you see a team, yeah, well, we're okay in that position. We're okay in that position. Let's have a look at this position till you get to the stage where you know for sure this is my best team. And you can only go on what's what what, what squad you have, Nathan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, I know I know Stephen said he was going to play for you know uh, three at the back and from the start. Um, but I always felt that you know you have to see. What group of players have I got? What positions have I got? Before you make up your mind, actually, what formation you're going to you're going to have? Is three at the back the best formation for the talent that Ireland have? But I don't like three at the back on a personal level. Mm. Uh, no, I don't think there's any need for it uh, because um, I, mean, I mean, when you're a manager in a team, you've got ten players out for your players. You've got to make the best use of those players, Nathan, right? And, and my take on it, as far as the foot, the, the uh, wing backs are concerned. If you play with four at the back, that's one man saved, right, if he can do the job. And I think that if the full backs, for the right back, for example, goes on the attack at the right time, you don't, you don't need a designated full back to do that. In other words, he's a defender when the ball's on the other side of the field, and then when you get on the attack and, and, and one of our players gets it, you go, either left side or right side. That's the way it's been in football. I mean, I... People talk about old-fashioned stuff. I mean, I, I played at the time. Say, at Leeds, for example, we had Paul Rainey or Paul Medley at right back, and Peter Lorimer got the ball. They were on the overlap. Mm. And Terry Cooper on the other side would be on the cover. Right? So when it came from t t on the other side, then Terry, K Terry Cooper would be the attacking fullback. So you don't need, a de in my opinion, a designated player to do that. It's a waste of a player. In midfield in Ireland, and I know we touched on this last week, but very little of what Ireland did, even when they did build possession or kept possession, came through the midfield. And there was a feeling that with the Stephen Kenny era that Ireland would start to see a lot more of the ball and dominate possession. That hasn't happened so far. Does another player in midfield make that easier? Do Ireland have the talent in midfield to play a possession-based game? What's your sense of where Ireland are with the likes of Cullen and Hendrick, Malumbi, McGrath? I don't. I don't want to be uh, harsh on them, but they're, they're much of a muchness, uh, Nathan. Mm. To be honest, like any two or three you pick, and, and uh, I mean, for, for what it's worth, I, I, I tell you what I would do. I would play two in the midfield, right, 
and I play McLean on the left side and Hogan on the right side as wide players in that position, right? A bit like going back to the Nuts Forest time when they were winning uh, the Champions League, mm. where you, you had uh, John uh, John Robertson, John Robertson, and uh, Martin Martin O'Neill yeah. on the right. And if you look at the midfield players that they have, they had they, they, they were ordinary players, but they had one job to do: get the ball, give it to these these two players, and let them get on with it. Because you're not going to have creative players, Nate. You're not going to have creative players. Yeah. And that's what we go. So if you get the two lads, two lads in the middle of the field, that make it easy for them. Because yeah. when they get it, give it out wide. Give it out wide. And, and the wingers at that time can also defend. And that's my take on it. And, and I know it's, 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 it's difficult to imagine, or maybe difficult to, what I'm saying. But if you don't have the creative midfield players, you don't have them. So make their job easy for them. Now, if they're not going to create, then you just have to try something else. Yeah. Give it to McLean. The, the argument against that, I guess, is that you would often talk about John Robertson and the influence that John Robertson could have in a game from, from that position on the wing, that yeah. for all that they can do, like Daryl Horgan is not John Robertson. No, no, well, he doesn't have to be. But he's the best we have. That's what I think, to, to do what's needed to be mm. done. I mean, you could play, we can play three midfield players, uh, midfield players, and if they're not doing it, they're not doing it, they're not going to create. So if you if you make the job easy for them, like you, like uh, uh, Clough did uh, with the with the two players, when McGovern was one, uh, I can't think of the other lad's name that played in the middle. No, Gov- McGovern came to Leeds, very very average player, really to be honest, really average. But he wasn't asked to do much. Get it? Give it out to O'Neill. Give it to Robertson. Now Robertson was a genius because he could, he could actually con- the only player I ever seen could control the game as a mid as a, a, a winger from that position. He was brilliant at it, always in a position to receive the ball. So anybody that played midfield, yeah, give it out to him. It was easy, and I, I think I think we could I think we could do that. I would try it if I was manager anyway. I'd have Horgan on the right, I'd have McLean out wide on the right, and, and don't forget when the ball's on the other side of the field, they can they can drop inside him and, and, and become a midfield player. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, move ahead then to choose the night in the game against Serbia but there was enormous pressure on Ireland ahead of that game there were a lot of questions about Stephen Kenny's future did Ireland answer any of those questions on Tuesday night it did feel as though it was a one-all draw that even Stephen Kenny and himself Serbia probably deserved to win that game was, was there anything you could take from that in performance in terms of improvement well the, the, the main thing you take it from it is that uh, the Bazunu is that the way we present it now, the yeah Bazunu, Bazunu yeah actually shows that he's a really, really outstanding player. Mm. Really outstanding player. And you have to name the other lad for me that came on at the page. Omar Bamadele. Omar a tough one. He's another one, young mm. fella, that looks a really, really good player. You could take from that. I mean, if it hadn't been for the goalkeeper, Nathan, we could have been beaten 3-0 or 3-1. There's no doubt about that. But what was good from the team in the situation that we're in... Um. They haven't stopped trying. And they haven't, what happens, in my experience in football, when the players lose confidence in the manager, they stop having a go. Have you ever seen that at international level for Ireland? Have, have you ever seen an Irish team that lost belief in the manager? Um, I, I played in the team <laughs> <laughs> that lost. Now I'm going that? back to the bad old days. Yeah. Where the, the selection committee picked the team. Right, and that was a joke. Now that was a real, real disaster. You had five fellas who had met with some of them. Someone just put a few quid into a club, and the next year they're picking the team. This was ridiculous, and we had no confidence and, and no belief in any manager that played at that time. Now and again, a daily mount, we'd, we'd get into it, but overall, it, the, the, the morale was awful. Can you talk about that? What that actually means—the difference between playing for a manager and not playing for a manager—is that I think are those conversations in a dressing room, are there people whispering over on the side? How does that actually come about? That as a group, somehow the players stop going out there wearing a green jersey and, and I don't know, wanting to do their best. Well, well, I can go back to the old days, uh, Nathan, where, where where we had a manager most of the time that didn't pick the team and that, mm. and the 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 the. the, the atmosphere in the dressing room before the match was awful. We were never going to never going to win. I remember playing Spain in a match uh, over there in, in, in Seville, I think it was. And uh, we, we, we had no confidence in ourselves and no goal. And uh, 
we went actually went uh, one front. Right. Right. I'm right. oh, sorry, but it's not 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 one front. Okay, we got a free kick, and one of the lads hit it and scored. Right. Now what happened? Instead of running back to the centre circle, we couldn't believe it. No, this is true. This is talking about atmosphere in the club. And the Spanish players picked up on it, ran to the referee, and the referee thought there's something odd here, and disallowed the goal. <laughs> disallowed the goal. And because we thought we, we're not allowed to score. That, that was the morale at that time. Right. And funny enough, 10 minutes later, we did score. So we should have been two up. We got a hiding 4 1. Yeah. Now, that's what. Now. That was in the bad, the really bad old days, you know. And, and who was in the? You, you, I know you've spoken before about the selection committee. So in the dressing room beforehand, who's coaching the team? Well, we, we did have a manager. Actually, Jackie Carey was there for a while with the great right. guy, Jackie Carey, who was one of the best players ever. One of a, a hero of mine and everybody else in Ireland that played football. He was a Manchester United captain when they won the cup in 1940. I was a, one of the great players. But he didn't have control of the situation. Right. He didn't pick the team. You know, so, like, even the lads who were playing in the team uh, w- wouldn't have the respect that was needed from the manager because they knew in the next match the team could change completely and the, the manager had no control over it. So he had no confidence in it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, now things have changed a lot since where the managers do pick the teams uh, uh, now, as we know. And... Uh, I think as far as the players are concerned now, and for a long time, they know the manager's in charge. Whether we Mick McCarthy or anybody, they know the manager picks the team and that's it. And I, I, what, I, what I've seen with the team now, and most of the Irish teams that I've seen over the last years, I've never seen the team not have a go. Right. And, and, and with Stephen, the lads went out there and all the matches that we played, three matches last week, they did have a go. And in, in most of the matches, we didn't play well enough uh, to do what's needed to be done. Mm. And that goes, that goes back to Stephen, because, the, the, as I say, the match in Portugal, then two of our best players didn't play in the position in the next match. It, it, and, 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 and Stephen is talking about the future. Yeah. You Can know, you talk like, about that? Because the, that press conference pre-match earlier in the week where Stephen Kenny spoke about building towards 2024 and how nobody really expected Ireland to be favoured to qualify from this group or maybe even to qualify at all, that they're building towards 2024. Is that fair enough when you look at the transition that Ireland are going through and the amount of young players he's bringing through? No, I wouldn't agree with it, Nathan. You know, what you find in football, the next match is the most important match. Three years three years ahead or four years ahead, well, in Stephen's case, three ahead, two years ahead. That's a lifetime in football. Mm. And you're talking about bringing young lads through. But there's a certain thing, a certain thing in it which is not good. If you say we're, we're planning for three years' time, well, what's Duffy going to think? And Coleman going to think? And these players who mightn't be there in three years', three years time. And as far as the young players are concerned, I've seen loads of promising players, Nathan, that in three years' time don't make it. Yeah. So you have to go from one match. And of course, you can put a couple of young lads in. But you, I don't think... Uh, you can really plan on three years. Football is not like that. Football is the next game. How do we do the next game? And then and you learn from it and try and win matches in between now and three years' time. Because nobody knows what's going to happen. You get I've seen it. Promising players come on. Now, three years' time, they're nowhere. And it's out of his hands, I guess, as well, when you talk about the likes of Bizzunu, who's at Manchester City on loan at the moment. Like, There's no guarantees as to what happens with his future. Likewise with Omid Bamadele, Ida, at club level, that's out of Stephen Kenny's hands as to how they develop uh, yeah, but, as but, players. But, but the, the one thing, though, Nathan, about the, 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 the goalkeeper, he's doing it now. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And what, what you'd, you'd put your money on him being a great goalkeeper. Well, I would anyway. Right. I think this is kid is think great. That good? Temperament is great. Like, you can't say that about any of the other young players. Mm. Far from it. They have a lot to do. They have a lot to, pro- to, to improve. Are they going to be playing in the club teams? Are they going to develop? So you can, I don't think it's, 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 it's reasonable or right to be talking about three years' time in, in any team. Just before be we talk about Stephen Kenny's future, just go back to Gavin Bazuna because I'm sure uh, you know, as you as a former Shamrock Rovers man, him as a former Shamrock Rovers man, they'd love to hear your opinion on him and, and how highly you do rate him then. What is it about him 
as a goalkeeper that you've seen so far that you've been so impressed with? The goalkeeper? Yeah. Oh, whatever, whatever good you're looking for in a keeper, I've seen it so far. His temperament, first of all. First of all, his ability to do what needs to be done, crosses, saves. I mean, he was brilliant uh, uh, in the match the other night uh, uh, against Serbia. Serbia. Mm. Brilliant. I mean, we could have lost them. We could have been four down before we scored, Nathan. And it looks like talking. I've heard him a couple of times on the television. After definitely humble lad, doesn't get not get carried away with it. The maturity at his age, his physique, they're all things you're looking for. Particularly the temperament. And he's been brilliant for a young fella. Um, you know, I, I nothing but, but a great future for him. Put that put put my life on him. Wow. Uh, yeah, it certainly is exciting to see what Gavin Bazuna does, does over the next few years. So, Stephen Kenny's future then, uh, with one win in 16 games and newspaper reports earlier in the week that maybe if things hadn't gone right against Serbia, that maybe a decision may have been taken then. Uh, Jonathan Hill, the CEO of the FAI, was talking today. There was a big announcement around a Sky sponsorship for the women's national team. So understandably, as you would expect when Jonathan Hill went in front of the media and our very own Stephen Doyle, he was going to be asked about Stephen Kenny's future. Here's what he had to say. Jonathan, just to ask you first, Stephen Kenny was asked last week about his position as the Ireland manager. There was talk of him being under pressure, possibly could lose his job if the results in the last international window didn't go well. Now, he did say during that that he was planning for the European Championship campaign 2024. Can you give any clarity as to where the FAI stands, how long his contract is? Have you looked beyond this current World Cup campaign? Look, uh, it's, it's, it's very simple and very clear. Stephen has a contract until the end of July 2022. Um, in relation to uh, the current campaign, we as a board uh, review any international window at the end of that window. So on a, on a monthly basis, we'll be looking at the overall World Cup qualification campaign in November. Um, and as a board, we'll discuss all of the areas and all of the issues um, and, yeah, we'll be thinking about it in terms of our own strategy and our own medium-term strategy, etc., etc. But um, uh, we'll have that conversation um, at that point. Would you agree that some of the reports last week, or with the reports last week, that said that he's under pressure if he doesn't get results, if he doesn't get winning results? Well, look, I think uh, uh, Stephen knows, and we talked about this earlier in our announcement of uh, the Sky uh, supporting uh, the Irish women's national team, uh, that we have an expectation before every game that we're going to uh, be competitive and win those games. Um, but football is football, and uh, we've had a range of performances, we've had a range of results. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, uh, we will review those, as I say, as we move forward. But does he need to win matches to keep his job beyond this current campaign? As I say, I'm not going to have that type of conversation until we get to the end of the campaign itself. So, John, Jonathan Hill there, the FAI CEO, really refusing to be drawn in some ways, but certainly not giving a ringing endorsement of Stephen Kenny and not mentioning anything about a grand plan for 2024. Where do you think right now then the FAI should be with Stephen Kenny? Is it leave it till the end of this campaign and make a decision? Or with the players who are coming through, does he deserve to be kept on until 2024 and to come out and get ahead of this story? Well, first of all, I think the statement that uh, Jonathan Hill made there was correct. Um, I think there's four more matches to go uh, in his uh, Nathan. Hmm. So, I mean, if I was in the position, I'd say uh, Stephen to continue for the next four matches. And then look at the situation from there, the overall situation, which is all you can do. I mean, if you took a decision now to say, right, we're not keeping him, you could win the next four matches. If you, told, if you said we are keeping him, you might lose the next four matches. So I think it's the, the sensible thing to do is let the ne next four matches run and hopefully the team improves and you could say, well, OK, we see where Stephen is coming from uh, and it, we can look to the future. That's the only time you can make the decision, Nathan. I mean, if we lose the next four matches or don't do well in the next four matches, then it's, it's, you'd have to say, well, uh, Stephen's had 20 matches and it hasn't really worked out. Mm. You'd have to say that. But I think it's realistic to say, well, there's no point in making the decision now uh, because there's, there's four matches to go in this particular tournament. Uh, it, it, it's most unlikely that we'll qualify anyway, Nathan. But... You could get four matches where you say, this team is really coming on. Or you could get four matches where we're, we're, we're no good. And I think the decision is made, to be quite honest, in the next four matches. And that decision, 
how much of that is results based the four games are Luxembourg Azerbaijan Portugal and a friendly against Qatar mm. that decision to continue till 2024 do you think that's solely based on those four results or is it based on the performance within those games I'd say it's mostly based if I was doing it uh, nice, on the performances because what you find if the performance is good usually the result is good mm. uh, you know it's no good saying well the performance is good and we were beaten you know, you'd have to see, well, this team is coming on. You know, you, we're all, the great thing about football, it's out in the pitch, uh, night, and everybody can see it. You know, you can't kid anybody. It's one of the great thing about sports, out in the pitch. We can see it. Is the team improving? Are they getting better? Is it? Are the young lads coming on? Is it, Johns? We're a year into this, 16 games. Have you seen signs that this team is progressing, is coming together? I, I must honestly say no. I haven't. I think because when, when we're playing the likes of Azerbaijan, and, and Luxembourg, you know, you're playing Portugal away. Actually, our, one of our best performances was Portugal away, which I regard as one of the top teams, mm. right? That's Is that fine. progress? We, we didn't win it, but yeah. but but you have to be you have to be beaten. You have to be winning matches. Right? You have to be, especially against uh, Azerbaijan and, and, and Luxembourg and teams around that. You know, like the players we we can produce in in, in for our international team, like. We have to do better than that. Yeah. Uh, no doubt we will come back to this again over the coming weeks and months, John. Um, yeah, I hope we do now. I, I, I mm. met Stephen. I think he's a very nice fellow. He's a good lad, really good lad. He loves the job. Uh, and, and I'd love him to be doing well. But we have, to, we have to look at the whole situation and take any personal feelings out of it. And that's what, we're, that's what I'm trying to do with you, Nathan. I'd love to be saying, oh, it's great. Everything is good. Stephen's doing a great job. And I'd love to be able to, but that, that's not the case at yeah. the moment. You know, we're not winning matches, and it's all about winning matches, Nathan. There's no doubt about that. Well, we want your honesty, John. That's the main thing. Um, I know you want to talk um, about Cristiano Ronaldo. We, you're pretty much out of time, but we'll actually next week we'll have seen him in action. He's playing on yeah. Saturday against Newcastle, and how that all knits together with himself and Fernandez and Pogba and Greenwood and all the attacking talent they have. So we'll spend a good bit of time on that next yeah. Thursday. Great to talk yeah. to you as always, John. Okay, thanks, Nathan. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved radio.